BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. You're listening to episode one of Factory Girls, an abridged reading of Michelle Gallen's uproarious and poignant new novel read by me, Neve McInhill. Maeve Murray is a forthright teenager who starts a summer job with her friends, undaunted by her pervy boss and thundering co-workers. But with its divided community and raw recent history, she has big aspirations to escape the wee Northern Irish town she has called home for 18 years. So expect some very strong language and adult themes. Thursday the 2nd of June 1994. Maeve Murray was just 18 years old when she first met Andy Strawbridge, but she knew he was a fucker the minute she laid eyes on him. In fairness, she'd expected it. He was an English man who drove into the town for work. She'd heard the stories about him taking his pick of the factory girls, offering them lifts home where he'd park his jag up some lonely lane so he could get a blowjob from whoever was belted into the front passenger seat. When Maeve stood face to face with Andy Strawbridge in his office in the factory, she knew every last word she heard about him was true. Maeve stuck her hand out at him. Hi, Mr Strawbridge. I'm Maeve Murray. Andy leaned back in his chair, smirking, his crotch bulging in the fanciest pair of trousers Maeve had ever laid eyes on. Maeve didn't get why no one warned her that he was a ride. Well, Maeve Murray... What can I do for you? Maeve sat down, took out her CV and tossed it on his desk. Then she took out a fag and lit it up like she was the friggin' boss. I'm looking into the factory for a summer job. Andy sat licking her with his eyes. Tell me, what's not in the CV? Maeve blew a tunnel of smoke at his desk mulling over what she thought she knew about herself. She dreamed in secret of writing for a fancy magazine in a swanky office in London. She couldn't wait to get out of the shitty wee town she'd grown up in and had learned everything she needed to know about burning bridges from her sister, Deidre. She knew it'd be a bad idea to share too much of this information with Andy Strawbridge. When my A-level results come out in August, I'm getting the frig out of this place. You're very sure of yourself, aren't you? May have realised there and then that Andy Strawbridge wasn't great at reading women. So tell me, why should I bother hiring and training you if you're going to walk out of my door as soon as you get your results? May have parroted what her mum had said over breakfast. I'd say your labour doesn't come much cheaper than teenage girls still living with their mummies. You can start Monday. Go down to Mary in the office. Maeve mashed her fag out in the ashtray, then she stood up and looked Andy dead in the eye. See you Monday. If you're lucky, Miss Murray, you'll see me. Maeve didn't know what Miss Murray meant, but she suspected Andy was being a dick. Maeve knocked on the office door and said, Hi, yes. Mary growled. Come on in. She was hunched over a fag behind a desk piled high with folders. Fabric samples, shirts and patterns lay in heaps on the chairs and floor. Maeve sat down beside a row of mucky green filing cabinets. Caroline sat opposite, tugging at her curly red hair and frowning at her form. Aoife held a clipboard on her lap and had her legs crossed, with one foot bobbing as if she was performing at a fish. Maeve had made Aoife go in to Andy first because she was giving her the books the way she was dressed in a lacy cream blouse. Maeve knew by the cut of Aoife that her mother had dressed her. Aoife. They'd learned in Irish class that Aoife meant pleasant radiance, while Maeve meant she who intoxicates, which betrayed just how much Irish Maeve's parents had understood at her christening back in 1976. Mary eyed Maeve as though she was a suspicious package. Did he give you a start? Aye. He said to come down to you for the paperwork. Mary sighed and got to her feet. Maeve's mum said she'd missed her true calling when they'd shut the Magdalen laundries. 
Mary picked up a form and glared at it as if it was filthy with sin. This is an equal opportunities form. She grabbed another one. These are the factory forms. May have read the equal opportunities questions and ticked the male, black, Jewish and lesbian boxes. Then she wrote her name, address, age, marital status, number of kids and next of kin on the factory forms, creating the sort of dossier that she knew paramilitaries often battered office workers to get hold of. That's it, she said, tossing her clipboard onto Mary's desk. That's me, signed up as a factory girl. Me too, Aoife said. Though it's just for the summer. We'll be university students by September, won't we? Caroline, female, white, Roman Catholic and heterosexual, placed her clipboard on the table. They chorused, thanks a million, and left. Maeve bagged the window seat in McHugh's bruise and they ordered tea for three. Maeve leaned in close to Aoife and Caroline. Well, what's the verdict on Handy Andy? He had lovely hands, Aoife said. Nice clean nails. Of course Aoife had noticed Andy's nails, while Maeve had been distracted by his crotch. Aoife was really fucking smart, but she was a complete muppet. If Aoife fell into a barrel of cocks, she'd come out sucking her own thumb. So, how'd your interview go? Maeve asked. Andy looked over my CV and asked a few questions, Aoife said in a voice as bright as a shop bell. Maeve wanted to spit nails in Aoife's shiny wee face. She hated how stuff worked differently for her and Aoife. Aoife came from money. She was the sort of pupil teachers dreamed of. What sort of questions? Oh, he wanted to know where I'd applied. He said he'd studied engineering science at Oxford, but prefers to practice management. I told him I was hoping to read law in Cambridge. And how was Handy Andy when you were in with him, Caroline? Maeve asked. Caroline shrugged. He asked about my attendance at school. He wanted to know which estate I'm from and I said that me and you come from Riverview. Maeve hated that Andy knew where she lived. The houses in their estate had got indoor toilets installed in the council's last big upgrade, but living there was still only a step up from squatting in the caravan site out the back of the chapel. The next morning, Maeve perched in the windowsill outside the shop, waiting for Aoife and Caroline. The summer that yawned before her, dank with boredom, was now sliced up into work days. Just one thing felt the same. The ticking time bomb of her exam results primed to go off in August. Maeve reached into her bag for a fag. She lit up, blowing smoke at the blue sky. That's when she noticed the sign above the shop. Two beds to let. J.P. Devlin, 78234. When Aoife and Caroline emerged, she pointed up at the sign. To let, Aoife said. It's about time I got a place of my own, Maeve said. Can you afford it? Not on my own. But we could afford it, Maeve linked arms with Caroline. She dragged Caroline over to the phone box and opened the door. A smell of pish and chips stung her nose. She kicked a soggy takeaway out the door, then checked the receiver for gum before putting it to her ear. Aoife? Yep. Lend us 20p. Maeve dropped Aoife's coin into the slot, then punched JP's number into the keypad. Bang on half twelve, the girls arrived outside the shop to meet JP. Maeve tried to look demure, a look she hadn't practised since her first Holy Communion. Ms Murray, Ms Jackson and Miss O'Neill. It was no shock that JP had already sniffed out who they belonged to or that he was surprised to see Aoife. Mr Devlin, how are you? Maeve said. Grant, Grant, JP replied. She felt him take the measure of her, from her scuffed bomb sail boots to her cracked leather jacket. So yous want to take a look at this place? We do, I. And who is it that's looking? JP asked glancing at Aoife. Not all three of you, surely? No, Mr Devlin, just myself and Caroline. We got a start in the factory and this place would be very handy for us. The factory, eh? 
under Andy Strawbridge? Maeve nodded, trying not to picture herself under Andy Strawbridge. JP unlocked the door of the flat and loped up the narrow staircase. Bedroom one, JP said, pointing. Kitchen, bathroom, bedroom two, and your living room. The flat smelt of fresh paint, but was carpeted with what looked like grey pubic hair glued onto a bed of thick black mould. When Maeve walked into the second bedroom, she knew right away it was going to be hers. It was lit by a big west-facing window. But its main selling point was what it didn't have. A doll-sized statue of the infant child of Prague and her dead sister's empty bed. The living room was occupied by a saggy sofa, two armchairs and a coffee table that seemed to have survived an interrogation that left it knock-kneed and scarred with cigarette burns. JP stood at the window, staring down at his BMW with an expression similar to the Virgin Mary gazing at the baby Jesus. Maeve looked out the window. Strawbridge and Associates, shirt factory squatted right across the road. So, Mr Davlin, how much is it? 25 quid a week. No parties, JP said. No drugs. Maeve fired him a wounded as if I would stare instead of the more accurate I friggin' wish look. Maeve thought of her brothers farting on the sofa, her mom stuck like a thorn in their armchair. We'll take it, she said. Maeve let herself in the door at home. The news was given the latest updates on the Chinook crash in Scotland. A forensics team was combing the ground for wreckage as a reporter noted that 20-something Brits had been wiped out in one go and the search for survivors was being called off. A military expert filed the TV screen, stressing that the tragedy was mostly like an accident caused by a mechanical fault. They'd hate to hand that to the area, Maeve's brother Paul said. It reminded Maeve of an old joke. I heard that an RUC patrol crashed into a tree in Fermanagh this morning. No way, her younger brother Chris said, all delighted. Yep, all four of them were killed. God, that's wild, May's mam said, shaking her head. Aye, the IRA said they planted it. Paul dead eyed her. You think you're so funny, don't you? I don't think it, Maeve said, flicking her hair. I know it. Paul and Chris turned their heads back to the tally. Is there any more news after the excitement of yesterday? Maeve was pretty sure her mum wasn't being sarcastic. Maeve's factory job was as much excitement as they could count on until the exam results came out in August. The whole town was waiting for the results. They'd decree who'd get away and who'd be left behind. Which families had the hope of a teacher or a doctor or a lawyer and which families would be kissing Woody Duffy's arse in the hope of a carpentry apprenticeship. Well, I've more news now, so I do. Maeve liked how her mum looked up at her. Do you now? I'll JP is renting out the flat above the shop. Maeve pulled a set of keys out of her pocket and shook them. Her brothers gawked. Then Chris punched Paul in the belly. I'm getting Maeve's bed. No way, Paul gasped. I'm getting it. Maeve watched the pair of them wrestle on the floor. Her four brothers slept in bunk beds crammed into a single room. Maeve and Deidre had always felt special, sleeping in single beds separated by a bedside locker and crucifix. But Maeve had been less keen on the room after Deidre had been stretchered out of it. So, what do you think, ma'am? Her mum led another fag. I'm going to move out tomorrow. Maeve dried up as her mum looked at her three narrowed eyes. Sometimes she felt like she was a female version of Icarus, spending hours collecting feathers, sticking them into wadges of hot wax to make the wings she needed to escape. Only instead of helping her, like Icarus's dad did, her mum kept picking at the wings. I thought you'd be pleased, she said. That I'm trying to stand on my own two feet? I'll be pleased when you eventually learn that you didn't lick your notions up with the street. She ground her fag out and turned back to the telly, where a small male frog was climbing a very tall tree in order to mate with a female. David Attenborough was explaining to Chris and Paul 
how this brave male frog was undertaking an arduous journey in order to impregnate his female of choice. A journey that required a great deal of strength and persistence. Maeve wished someone like Oprah Winfrey had butt in to explain what the poor female frog, who was rapidly running out of the tree to climb, might be trying to tell the male. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Factory Girls by Michelle Gowan. Episode 2. It's Maeve's first day at Strawbridge and Associates. She's not had much to do with Protestants before and perhaps more worryingly, men like her boss Andy. Monday the 6th of June 1994. At 5 to 8 the doorbell to the flat rang. Aoife was waiting outside wearing jeans and her Elastica t-shirt under her black leather jacket. Maeve was raging that Aoife, a total gam, had managed to look cool for working in the factory. Mary was scowling beside the factory doors. They followed her through the double doors and she showed them where to clock in. When the thick of the crowd was through, Mary growled at them down to the factory. It was clear that Mary was not a morning person and may have had a suspicion that she might not turn out to be an afternoon, evening or night person either. As they crossed the factory floor, a bell rang. The machinists squeezed themselves into their stations and the clatter of sewing machines began to ricochet off the bare walls. Mary hooshed them into the office. May have sagged with relief when the door shut against the racket. Mary frowned at Caroline. Ms Jackson, Andy wants you in the machines. Basic training for one week and then we'll see if you're fit for full production. Aye, grand, thanks Mary, Caroline said, tugging at her curls. You too. Andy wants you's impressing. Every shirt has to be ironed before it goes out the door. Maeve's mum had taught her that ironing clothes was a mug's game because most clothes look the same after an hour or so anyway. I've asked Marilyn Spears to show you the boards and irons. The name Marilyn Spears was as proddy as they came. A cross-community experience was looming. Ms Jackson, you're coming with me, Mary said. And used to, use her with Marilyn. As Caroline slunk off, Maeve felt panic scuttle through her guts. She had no idea how to be natural with prods. Thanks to segregated housing estates, schools, churches, shops, pubs, takeaways and Christmas trees, she had limited exposure to the 1,500 Protestants who made up the other side of their town, despite living in it with them for over 18 years. But, lit by a spirit of peace and reconciliation, she had adopted a cheery smile. Hi Marlin, I'm Maeve. And this doll here is Aoife. Marlin looked sideways at Maeve. Just so you know, as long as I'm training you as Muppets, I'm on basic pay. So can you get a move on? Marilyn barged through the doors and let them swing back in May's face. The ironing boards were mounted on sturdy bars that were anchored to the floor with fat screws. A thick silvery cushion covered the boards. Marilyn slammed her hand onto the board. First thing you need to learn is the vacuum suck, Marilyn said. She stepped on a footboard that triggered a vacuum. The ironing board sucked in a deep, sort of terrified breath. It pulls the shirt tight to the board, Marlin said, rolling up her sleeves. The irons were powered by cables that coiled over their heads. Marlin pulled a stopwatch out of her pocket. She handed it to Aoife. Time me. When Aoife pressed the top button on the stopwatch, Marlin plucked the shirt off the trolley, unpinned the sticker tag, popped the pin in her mouth and stuck the sticker on her left shoulder. Then she threw the shirt on the ironing board and worked its speed before throwing the shirt onto the rail. Aoife stopped the timer. 32 seconds? May have hated that Aoife sounded impressed. So, Marilyn said, wiping a lick of sweat off her forehead. Have yous got it? May have nodded. 
So? Show me, ladies, Marilyn said, all smug. Maeve's heart sank, but she picked up a shirt and started to iron like her life depended on it. She was pure delighted when she was the first to throw a shirt onto the reel. She stood there, waiting for Marilyn's approval. What are you standing there for, you div? Marilyn said as she started examining the shirt. Keep pressing. Sweat trickled down Maeve as she grabbed another shirt. Not bad, Marilyn huffed as she draped Maeve's shirt onto the packing table. Maeve threw another shirt over the rail and picked up her third. What the fuck is this? Marilyn suddenly shrieked, pointing at Maeve's second shirt. It's missing the button! Marilyn was so full of outrage, you would have thought she'd discovered a severed dick in the breast pocket of the shirt. You can't pass a damaged shirt down the line. It has to go back to repairs. Marilyn flung the shirt into a basket, then bellowed. Shite like that shouldn't get past Fidelma. Aye. Well, nobody's fucking perfect, are they? Fidelma roared back. Nobody may have knew you had ever dared speak to Fidelma Hegarty like that. Right, you used to quit, Marilyn said. Maeve put down her iron with relief. The stickers are how you figure out who's done what, right? Aoife asked. Aye, Mary can trace every bitty shirt back to the person who did it. And the stickers tell her if you've hit your target and got into a bonus. My sticker says two and a half P per shirt, Maeve said, trying to do the sums in her head. But Aoife beat her to the answer. So wafty iron, 70 shirts an hour to hit our basic. Well, aren't you the wee genius? Marlin sneered. Seriously? 70 shirts an hour? Maeve said. Th that's more than one a minute. Marlin folded her pudgy arms across her chest. That's right. Do you think you're not fit for it? Maeve shook her head, lifted a shirt and set to work. When the lunch bell rang, Maeve put her iron down. Her right arm was numb and she felt like boking. What are you two doing for lunch? Eve asked, massaging her shoulder. Sandwiches in the flat? Want to come? They crossed the road and climbed upstairs to the flat. Caroline and Aoife collapsed onto the sofa. Cheese and pickle, do you? Aoife and Caroline nodded. Maeve threw some sandwiches and milky tea together. How's it going with the pressing? Caroline asked. Maeve looked at the blisters on the back of her hand, where she'd scorched herself with the steam. My arm's killing me, so it is. What's it like in the machines? Ah, oh, um, just practising in scraps, Caroline said. They won't let me under the epaulettes until I'm ready. What the fuck is an epaulette? It's this sort of tab they sew under the shoulder of a fancy shirt. The English like them. Ah, oh, sure. The English, Maeve said, before taking a gulp of tea to swallow down what she was scared of blurting night that she was stunned by how hard and fast the work was. Maeve wanted to quit already, but she couldn't. She needed money for rent and to save for London. By Wednesday, Maeve had established a lunchtime routine. Each morning, she made three lots of cheese and pickle sandwiches, and when the factory lunch bell rang, she scooted out of the door and over the road as fast as she could with Aoife and Caroline. Jesus! That's us over the halfway mark of our first week. It's getting a bit easier, do you not think? Aoife asked. It's not getting easier, Caroline said. We're getting hardier. On Thursday, somewhere deep beneath the scalded patches of skin, the muscle cramps and sweat-soaked feet may have felt a lick of energy. She realised that she'd get used to the standing and pressing, to the short breaks and long days, and the milky tea, and dirt prods. That she'd make it not just to the end of the week, but to the start of autumn. Maeve pictured her wage packets bursting in front of her week after week throughout the summer, paving her path to London and Pound Coins. At five o'clock, Andy strutted down the stairs and began a round of the factory floor. Everyone seemed on alert now that he was out and about on the factory floor. Maeve saw Sharon Rogers pause near Fidelma Hegarty. She murmured. 
I wonder who you'll do today. Fidelma snorted and glanced at Maeve. She put her head down and tried to keep an eye on Andy at the same time. She lost sight of him when he entered the line behind her. The next minute, Sharon Rogers yelped and dashed towards the toilets, her arms crossed over her chest. Maeve kept pressing. She didn't know what it'd take for her to drop her iron and miss her target, but it was clearly more than a startled prod. Then his shadow fell across Maeve's ironing board. Her heart was pounding, and a not unpleasant pressure was building in her knickers. Andy watched her work for what felt like a long time. You seem to have got to grips with the work, Ms. Murray. Well, it's hardly rocket science, is it? Andy moved closer behind Maeve. It's not, he agreed over her shoulder. But you're a natural, Maeve. Then he slipped two fingers onto her arms and made a gentle circular motion that tickled her ribs. Maeve's nipples hardened and she whirled around to face him. Then she realised that her bra was undone. And Andy was looking. Everyone except for Aoife had seen what happened, but nobody said a word. Maeve crossed her arms over her chest and walked to the toilets, her face blazing. Sharon Rogers came out of a toilet stall and glanced at Maeve's chest. So we did ye? Maeve nodded. He's a fucker, Sharon said. You, watch yourself. I will, Maeve said, ducking into a stall to fasten her bra. She wasn't sure if she was more unsettled by what Andy had done to her or by hearing a prod offer you watch yourself as advice rather than a threat. Maeve woke on the dot of 7.30, even though her alarm was off. It was Friday and that meant payday. Maeve showered and got dolled up. She didn't go too fancy, just black trousers with a black top and her black leather jacket and biker boots. She did Audrey Hepburn eyes and killer lips to soften the biker vibe. Then she went into the living room where Caroline was still sitting in her pyjamas. Ugh, Maeve, I'm wrecked. I need my tea. But we have to go over to get our checks. Could you not pick mine up for me? Maeve looked out of the window. A queue of people was waiting at the factory door. Paddy Quinn unlocked it and everyone traipsed inside. Maeve saw Andy's jag pull into the car park. She watched him climb out and stretch before he jogged over to the factory. Frigate, I'll go then. But you owe me. Mary glanced up at Maeve, licked her forefinger and then flicked through a shoebox containing brown envelopes. She selected one and passed it to Maeve. Thanks a million. Can I get Caroline's too? There you go. Mary said, holding Caroline's envelope out. When Maeve got back to the flat, she ripped her pay packet open and pulled out the cheque. £83.25. She frowned. There was no way she'd made 13 in bonus. The 130 extra shirts she'd ironed over the week had earned her a bonus of 3 25 which felt about right. But her basic wage was set at £80, and she was sure Mary had said their basic was £70. She got up and went into Caroline's bedroom. How much do you get? Caroline shrugged and reached for her sealed envelope. My cheque's £70. Give me a look at your pay slip, Maeve said. She scanned the figures. Huck. Your basic's £70, but Mary's made a hames of mine. She set it at £80. She has not. She has too. Oh, I'd better go and get it sorted. Mary's cough echoed through the empty factory. Maeve took a deep breath before knocking at her door. What are you after? Mary asked, squinting at her. Ock, I just need to check my payslip with you, Maeve said, laying it on the desk. It's a tenner out. Mary glanced at the slip, then looked back at Maeve through narrowed eyes. I don't make mistakes, Ms. Murray. I pay people what Andy tells me to pay them. If you're expecting an extra 20 quid in your pay packet, Ms. Murray, I suggest you inquire with Andy up in his office. Maeve's stomach dropped. Andy had deliberately set her basic 10 quid higher than the factory standard, and Mary thought Maeve was in wheedling for even more money. 
Anything else you'd like me to do for you, Ms. Murray? Or do you think I can get on my work now? Maeve shook her head and left Mary's office. She walked towards the foot of the stairs, then stopped. She didn't have the guts to face Andy, to ask him what the money was about, so she turned to leave. Suddenly the canteen door swung open and Andy walked out. Can I be of assistance to you? Maeve shook her head. She felt trapped but didn't know why. Andy wasn't blocking her way. Payday today, Miss Murray. I hope you spend your hard-earned money wisely. Something shifted and Maeve pulled away. That's where you're wrong, Andy. I'm not spending. I'm saving. And what are you saving for? London, she said over her shoulder as she walked towards the exit. I hope you've got a big piggy bank, Miss Murray. Back into the flat, Maeve found Caroline snuggled into the sofa with a cup of tea and a magazine. Did you get your pay sorted? Maeve hesitated. Aye. Uh, it's sorted, she said, hearing the scratchy feel of her voice in her throat. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Factory Girls by Michelle Gallen. Episode 3. Maeve's thrown herself into her new job and her new flat for the summer. She's planning a bright future in London. That is, as long as she gets the right exam results. But escaping the traumas of the past will be even more difficult. Maeve and Caroline were lying in the living room with a wee community of dirty teacups gathered at their feet. Oh, Aoife and James will be here soon, Caroline said, yawning. They'd known James, Aoife's brother, as long as they'd known Aoife. And Maeve had known since she was 15 that James had a fancy for her. And she liked him back. He was smart and kind and funny. He never felt the need to flash the family cash or swing his mickey to act the big lad. She knew James O'Neill would be a catch in any town, never mind their town. She loved his blue eyes, his wide shoulders, his fingers on the fiddle. But James was like the syrup saucers her dad set out to drown the wasps at the end of the summer. If she wanted to get out of the town, she needed to steer clear. Caroline was staring at the corner of the room that was in the morning for a telly. They'll all be watching neighbours over at our house. Oh, sure, you can watch the omnibus with Nana Jackson tomorrow, Maeve said, rolling her eyes. Then the doorbell rang. Caroline went out to open the door. James struggled up the hall and staggered into the living room where Aoife helped him lower a black bag onto the floor. Heavy old thing, that, he said. Then he looked around the living room. Nice place. Maeve shrugged like the flat was no big deal. It's better than the kip I share in Belfast. What's in that, James? Caroline asked, nosing at the black bag. A wee housewarming prezzy? Aye, well, if you want it, it is, James said, pulling the bag away, revealing a TV bigger and newer than the only telly in May's family home. Oh my God, a telly? Caroline squealed. Maeve sat a bit deeper in her chair. Giving them away free in the cornflakes now, are they? Oh, well, I just got a new one for my room, so this one's not needed, James said, taking a redner. We thought you could use it here and pass it on to St. Vincent de Paul when you're leaving, Aoife said, a prickle of annoyance in her voice. Maeve got the message. It'll be deadly to get Anders and Corey again, she said, with a smile that hurt her cheeks. Thanks a million. James moved the tally into the corner of the room and tuned in the channels. Aoife found a cookery programme. The door hadn't slammed behind Aoife and James before Maeve switched over to Eurotrash. Later that evening, Caroline dozed on the sofa while Maeve cosied into her sleeping bag. The last news bulletin of the day flashed across the screen. Maeve watched footage of over 2,000 Harland and Wolf workers striking outside the shipyard gates, protesting at the murder of their colleague. 
She wondered if their factory would walk out if one of them was murdered. Tags in support of prods, prods in support of tags, saying fuck whatever the bosses wanted, whatever the paramilitaries demanded. Tears suddenly pricked her eyes. Despite having seen movement after movement rise up and crash like waves in a shore, Maeve wished that one demonstration would work, that something would bring an end to the violence. It broke Maeve's heart to imagine being left to themselves, free of the Brits, relieved of the free staters, unencumbered by bosses, to grow up and grow old. But she'd learned to keep a lid on feelings like that, on most feelings. Monday 13th of June 1994. Maeve finished her basket of shirts, so she sailed out for a fag break. She sat down beside Vidalma Hegarty. Vidalma grounded her fag out with the heel of her shoe, then eyed Maeve. You're very young to have such a filthy habit, Maeve. When do you start smoking? Maeve shrugged casually as if to say, sure, wasn't a born smoking. She shook back her hair. Young enough, I suppose. Sixteen? She said that like she didn't remember the exact minute she smoked her first fag, but it was June 1992. Maeve had been sitting the last of her GCSEs. They'd buried her sister Deidre the month before. Every day after the funeral, her mom had dragged herself up the road to the chapel to light a candle for Maeve's exams, before stumbling out to the graveyard to stare at the plastic-wrapped flowers rotting on top of Deidre's grave. Maeve remembered her mom saying, Keep your head screwed on for these exams. You've your whole life ahead of you to cry. Deidre's last pack of fags had been Maeve's first. After the doctors had told Deidre she totally fucked her liver with the paracetamol, Maeve asked her if she wanted anything. A fag, she'd said, looking at the ceiling. And they turned back the clock. Maeve had gone home and pulled Deidre's handbag out from under her bed and found the cigarettes. Then she delved back into Deidre's bag and found an empty pill bottle. Miss Deidre Murray, 200 paracetamol tablets, use as directed. Avoid alcohol. Deidre had collapsed four days after swallowing every single tablet. Nothing had been the same since. Maeve realised Fidalma was eyeing her. Sure, we could die any minute. Any one of us, she said. Mm, true enough, Fidalma said. And the Brits will probably get you before John Player does. She headed back into the factory, leaving Maeve underneath the rumble of a hovering army helicopter. Missing Deidre. Mary walked up to Maeve's station. Andy wants to speak to you, she said. Maeve nodded but kept pressing, intent on finishing the shirt she'd just started. No, Mary snarled. Maeve climbed the stairs, conscious of glances from the factory floor. Her heart was still banging when she knocked and opened the office door. Yes, that's right, Andy said into the phone, while gesturing at Maeve to enter. Oh, I understand, Lucinda. I know you appreciate the challenges inherent in integrating low-skilled workers from a deeply divided community into a modern, desegregated working environment. Maeve dropped into the chair nearest her. Yes, I'm very much looking forward to our next meeting too, Andy said, stretching back in his chair and stroking his tie. Thanks again, Lucinda. Maeve waited for Andy to do the trail of bye-bye, bye-bye-byes that everyone she knew did before they put the phone down. But he acted like a character in a soap opera. Bye, he said, before banging the handset into the cradle. Maeve felt sorry for Lucinda on the other end, saying her bye, 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 byes, before realising she was bidding farewell to a dial tone. That, Andy said, was Lucinda Taylor of Invest NI. She supports enterprises that are committed to building sustainable companies in communities such as this. The way Andy said, communities such as this, Give me of the dirty, disappointed feeling she got when reading books like The Railway Children. Other communities were nicer than hers. 
So it's our job to prove to your investors that this factory is in some dodgy business. Set up to suck as much money as possible out of them before it goes tits up. You have a gift for translating the Queen's English into your Northern Irish vernacular. Me have nodded, thinking, fucking right I do. But that particular skill won't be of much use to you over in London, Ms. Murray. May have realised that Andy wasn't like the agent she'd fooled at her university admissions interview. Andy looked at her like the mouthy wannabe she was. All fur coat and no knickers. So, how does one earn the respect of the English? Maeve asked. Andy picked up the book. I think you ought to read this. How to win friends and influence people. How will that help me? It'll teach you a thing or two about people skills, Miss Mary. Andy looked at her with amusement. At lunchtime, Mia fired her new book onto the coffee table in front of Caroline and Aoife. So, Andy thinks that's going to help me out over in London. It's a business classic, Aoife said. So I should actually give it a go then? Maeve asked. Yes, do. It's kind of like a, a cross-community relations programme, only aimed at helping you get on with everyone, rather than just Protestants. On Thursday afternoon, Maeve was warbling along to Wigfield when the main doors swung open. Three men walked in and paused at the top of the factory floor. One of the men pointed at Billy Stone, who put down the roll of fabric he was working on. There was a short, intense conversation. Then Billy stormed out of the side door. Maeve and everyone else kept working. Right at the tail end of the news bulletin on the radio, the newscaster noted that reports were coming in of a multiple shooting in Belfast. Glances leapt like flames across the factory floor. Mouths hardened. Eyebrows twitched. The best Maeve could do was put her head down and try to keep her focus on her own targets. A few minutes before the four o'clock news, Paddy Quinn and Fidelma Haggerty marched out of the fire doors. Maeve slunk out after them. Paddy fiddled with his pocket radio. A grave newsreader announced that the Irish National Liberation Army had shot several men outside the headquarters of the Ulster Volunteer Force on the Shankill Road. A local politician condemned the violence as a scurrilous attack on innocent Protestant people. Maeve sighed. That sort of shit put her right off journalism. She didn't get how the reporter could stand idly by letting someone describe the people who hung about a paramilitary HQ as innocent. So the INLA's decided to fuck things right up for everyone? Fidelma Hegarty said, growling from deep in her throat like one of those big cats may have loved watching in nature documentaries. But why are the INLA starting up now when there's all this talk about peace? May have asked. Fidelma snorted. <laughs> That's no INLA attack. That's the IRA settling scores before they give up their guns. Fidelma paused and looked down at Paddy. He said nothing. The UVF will not be long in retaliating. They'll be after another grey steel. A weight sank into me as guts. She remembered the UVF attack on the Rising Sun bar in grey steel the Halloween before. Trick or treat! The gunmen had roared before opening fire. They'd run off laughing, leaving eight dead and 19 wounded. Paddy collapsed the radio aerial. The IRA can't be held responsible for the actions of the UVF, he said quietly. In the silence that followed, something clicked inside Maeve. The IRA must be serious about a ceasefire if they're at shit like this. She said. Have you not learned yet that the IRA is always serious? Paddy asked, then headed back indoors. Fidelma frowned. Mm, we'll have to lay as low as Larn Catholics for the next while. Maeve nodded. She knew the drill. Head down, back against the wall, emergency exits noted. The UVF shot a Catholic taxi driver that Friday then gunned down a couple of Protestant builders they'd mistaken for tags. Maeve was pure relieved when Aoife said that James was willing to drive them over the border for a night out. 
She was dying to get out of town and into a free state pub where she could sink a pint without flinching every time the door opened. They ended up staying at the sand house for hours. Aoife and James brought their fiddles, which meant their table had free drink carried to it. Caroline got drunk enough to sing, Only our rivers run free, which made all the old fuckers wet-eyed and gave the younger lads a hard on. Maeve couldn't bear how everyone missed the friggin' point of the song, so she took herself away outside for a fag. She was staring at the waves when the door opened behind her. It was James. Are you tired? Do you want to head home? Maeve shook her head. I'm fucking tired of home, is my problem. Well, not long till you get the results. You'll be away before you know it. The waves crashed in the silence. Will you miss nothing about the town when you're gone? I miss Caroline. But I'm hoping me and Aoife will see each other when we're in England. And maybe I can visit you too. When I'm over to see Aoife. May have tried to imagine James in London. He looked at that moment the way she liked him. Salt slicked by sea spray. His fingertips hot and red from the fiddle strings. Wearing a look of such hope that her heart near broke. I'd love to show you around London. James smiled and took a step forward just as a side door opened. James? Aoife stood in the doorway, light haloing her body. She squinted at Maeve and James. They've been asking for more since Jig. Coming, James said, stepping into the light. Then he glanced at Maeve. I'll be in after this, she said, waving her fag. When the door closed, she took a last drag, then flicked the glowing butt out into the ocean. She knew James didn't approve of smoking. And she had this feeling that Aoife didn't approve of her. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Factory Girls by Michelle Gowan, Episode 4 It's the summer of 94 in a wee Northern Irish town and Maeve's doing her best to ignore sectarian tensions around her. But the special treatment she's getting from English boss Andy isn't doing cross-community relations much good. Maeve put the finishing touches to the sparkly shamrock she'd drawn on her cheek with some emerald eyeshadow and blew herself a kiss in the mirror. She was still hungover after the night before, but Ireland was playing Italy in the World Cup. Her and Caroline made their way down to the old school bar. Maeve rapped on the locked door using the I'm a tag open says me knock they used when times were tense. Iggy Lochery opened the door just wide enough to let them squeeze in, then bolted it shut again. They were only there for the crack. But 12 minutes into the game, Ray Houghton chipped the ball into the corner of the goal and Maeve and everyone else in the bar jumped to their feet and roared before guldering the fields of Athenry along with 60,000 Irish fans in the giant stadium. When the final whistle blew, Maeve collapsed back in her seat like she'd been concussed by a blast. She'd tasted winning and she liked the smack of it. The next morning, Maeve dragged herself down the road home for Father's Day. The news had given her a worse sickening than the booze. She knew nobody wanted to watch footage, but nobody could switch over. They owed the wee man who died in a bar in Lochan Island while cheering for Ireland that much. ...a direct reprisal for the INL shooting at the UVF headquarters on the Shankill Road recently. Maeve's dad loved Father's Day. When she was younger, she'd always ask him what he wanted. And every year, he'd give the same answer. Sure, what would I want when I have six wains? Daddy! She'd squeal, delighted. ...one of horror, one of sadness. We are undoubtedly now in a spiral of tit for tat killing. I have one daughter to wash dishes and clothes, and I've one to cook and clean. Maeve had complained that she wasn't his slave. Deidre had said something around women's rights. And of four lumps of cubs, he'll play for Tyrone. Eleven people were shot in the back. Six men are dead. He'd open his presents, dabbing on the aftershave, offering the sweets around. The RUC never gives up. You will be caught and you will spend long years in prison. We will leave no stone unturned. 
Maeve's mom clucked her tongue. Well, now, at least they saw the goal scored before they were killed. Her dad bit the head of a jelly baby. Maeve stared at the telly, thought of the civil wee man with his comb over, the undrunk pint sitting flat on the bar. Yet another community brought to the edge of despair by the paramilitary. Friday, 25th of June, 1994. That morning, Maeve ripped her envelope open and pulled out her payslip, hoping to see £123, the amount she'd figured she was due, but the total was just 92 65 A second later, she'd noticed the name on the payslip. Marilyn Spears. Ah, oh, fuck. Fuck! What's up? Caroline called from the kitchen. Mary's mixed my payslip up with Marilyn Spears. May have pictured Marilyn Spears exhibiting her pay slip all round the proddy side of town. Soon everyone would know about the extra tenor Andy was paying her. She was fucked. May have tried to explain to Aoife why she was so fucked, but Aoife didn't get it. It's Andy's factory. He can pay people whatever he likes, she said imperiously. Caroline looked up from her bag of cheese and onion potatoes and sighed. That might be true, Aoife, but Marilyn Spears been in the factory a lot longer than Maeve. And she's got three wains. There'll be a bad feeling about Maeve's pay. But why did he give you extra? Aoife asked quietly. Maeve turned to face the window. I thought Mary had made a mistake. She said she doesn't make mistakes and told me to tackle Andy myself. And did you? I chickened out the first day, and when I tackled him, he said he reckoned I could do with all the help I could get. A glint of agreement flickered over Aoife's face. But why didn't you tell us? Uh, I don't know. Maeve shrugged, tears pricking your eyelids. It felt dodgy, and I didn't want any shite off him or you or anyone else. Uh, wish you'd told us, though. Caroline said softly. Maeve realised if her own best friends were this sore on her, the factory would be a hundred times worse. Later that evening, Maeve headed home, hoping to have a quiet word with her dad about her payslip. But her mum was sitting alone in the living room, watching a special report on the high unemployment in Derry. Where's Daddy? On his way to Belfast with Toot Maguire. Did he get on to a new trial? Aye, a two-week one. They're delighted. Thousands her dad got for a couple of weeks of lying in bed, popping pills, pissing into test tubes and letting nurses drain his blood. There was always the chance of things fucking up, like they'd done for her cousin, Josie, who'd taken a reaction to the injections he'd got in a trial and ended up with bad kidneys. The compensation was good, was the only thing. As her auntie Mary had said, sure, half the young ones these days end up with the kidneys gone after a night out at the pills. At least this way he's got a lovely wee house, idiot. Fingers crossed he gets the placebo, Maeve said. Well, now, you know your father. No luck at the horses, but he's done well with the drugs. They fell silent as some thin strip of misery that had been dug out of the bog side whinged on the tally about the lack of jobs. There's no jobs now. Och, dry your fucking eyes, would ye? Maeve's mam spat at the tally. Ah, uh, I'm away out for a walk. She slammed the door when she left. Monday, 27th of June, 1994. When Maeve entered the factory, eyes slippery as snake tongues flickered over her. She dandered over the office like she was on a day out. Mary looked up at her over her glasses. What do you want? There was a wee mix-up with the wages on Friday, Maeve said tugging Marlin's payslip out of her pocket. Mary's eyebrows shot up. Did I get something wrong? Well, well my paycheck was grand, but I had the wrong payslip. I got Marlin's. Marlin probably has your payslip, Mary said, shrugging. Sure, why don't you go down there and check? Something about the way Mary looked back down at her order forms told me of that Mary had deliberately swapped the payslips. Marilyn Spears was standing beside her machine. When she spotted Maeve, she slowly folded her arms and glared at her. 
Mary seems to have made a wee mistake with the payslips, Maeve said. She offered Marilyn her payslip. Thanks, Marilyn said, snatching it and throwing it in the table. Though I uh, have to say I'd rather have that fat check you're getting, not to mention the big basic you're on. Marilyn brandished me of slip in the air. Says on here, she goldered over the machinist's head, that Maeve Murray, a temporary worker with a couple of weeks' experience, is on a basic of eighty pounds. Almost everyone stopped and listened. And apparently, Marilyn continued, she earned herself a bonus of forty three pound forty five. Marilyn picked up her own payslip. Marilyn Spears, she screeched. Mother of three, full time machinist with ten years' experience. Her bingo wings flapped as she waved her payslip in Maeve's face. Basic, seventy pounds. Bonus, twenty two pounds sixty five. Marilyn, I, I don't begrudge you a penny or your bonus, Maeve Murray, for I saw what you did there in that. But what I want to know is. What the fuck you're doing behind closed doors for Andy Strawbridge is earning you an extra tenner a week? It felt like the factory had sucked its breath. Is there a reason why these machines are not producing? Andy wrapped the metal railings with a ruler. Oh uh-huh. <laughs> ho, I see your fancy man's keeping an eye out for you, Marlin said, flicking me his payslip at her. I don't need no man to look after me, Maeve answered watching her payslip flutter to the ground. Then she picked it up and walked back to her board. Maeve grabbed a shirt and plunged into a blizzard of cuffs, collars, sleeves and backs. Going to work the next morning, Maeve clocked Andy, standing in silence at the top of the factory, watching everyone come in. At eight o'clock, Mary closed the main doors with a clump that Maeve felt in her spine. OK, you lot, Andy said, sniffing. Later today, some men from McAllister's will drop in to check this place out. If they like what they see, a nice big contract will come our way. Murmurs of approval eddied around the factory. The McAllister Bucks arrived shortly after the first tea break and Andy escorted them both up the stairs. They landed back out just before lunch. Mary walked them to the door, but she came back scowling. She stopped in front of the packing table and goldered. Stop, witches are at, and get up here. Ten identical shirts lay in front of Mary. The McAllister fellas want to see what she's can do. She selected a shirt. They want 100 of these by the end of the day. Oh, for fuck's sake, Mary. Marlon Spears groaned. If we win this order, we could switch to a five-day week, Mary said. She played her trump card. An extra day's pay would be life-changing. Right, Mary said, scowling at her watch. Time to crack on. Ten loose shirts lay on the packing table and another ninety sat folded and boxed when Andy and the McAllister fellas burst back through the factory door later that afternoon. The next morning after tea break, Andy was standing on the balcony. I heard back from McAllister's. He paused, clearly enjoying the way the whole factory was hanging on his words. We've won the contract, Andy said, louder, clenching his fist in the air as if he was Nelson Mandela. By way of a celebration, I'm putting some dosh behind Kelly's bar tomorrow night. The promise of free booze triggered a few yips from the country ones. Kelly's, Marlon Spears squawked. The prods had shrunk back in on themselves, eyeing each other. Yes, Kelly's bar, Andy answered briskly. May have liked drinking in Kelly's. It had a wee bar that farmers liked to stand in, clabbered to the knee and shout. There was a lounge with a jukebox that always had a good mix of ones on it. We were hard-pressed to find a bar that'd take both sides, Mary said, clicking over at Paddy Quinn. Kelly's were the only ones. Still a fucking tag bar, Mary. No harm, do you? Or Andy? Billy Stone said. Back to work. Andy snapped. Maeve picked up her scorching iron. 
She wondered what it would be like to go drinking with a squad of prods. And Andy. The next morning, there was a party feeling in the factory. The country ones, God help them, had come in already dressed up under their fleeces. Maeve's one actual privilege in life was that she hadn't been born a culture. The town was shite, but the country was full of actual shite. Not everyone in the factory was in good humour. Billy spent much of the day pacing around the yard, smoking, looking like some hot bit of stuff in a prison drama. They got as far as the afternoon break before Billy exploded. Free beer or no? You'll not find me darkening Kelly's door. He snarled, standing up. The whole canteen fell silent. Billy, Marlon Spears said. There's many's another person sitting here that feels like you, but drinks drink, or ever it's swallowed. Maeve's feet were killing her by the time they reached Kelly's bar. Jesus, but you scrub up well, Maeve Murray, Mickey McCanny said. You must be going somewhere fancy. Maeve rolled her eyes, then she sailed over to a corner table with Aoife while Caroline went to the bar. Andy was sitting on a high stool at the end of the bar in his work suit. He doesn't really fit in, does he? Aoife said. No, he looks like a bit of a dick, Maeve said, though she felt like she was the bigger dick for saying that. How to win friends and influence people advised against slagging people off, even behind their backs. Caroline put their drinks on the table. Aoife nodded in Andy's direction. Do we know how much money he's put behind the bar? She asked. No idea, so we'd better crack on, Maeve said, clinking glasses with Aoife and Caroline. Then they started at the drinking like the targets to hit and bonuses to earn. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Factory Girls by Michelle Gallen. Episode 5. Celebrating a new shirt contract, the employees of Strawbridge and Associates are enjoying a night out courtesy of Andy. But for some of the workers, being in a Catholic bar doesn't go down as well as the free drink. Maeve was more than a few sheets to the wind by the time she found herself at the bar beside Andy. You're looking rather well tonight, Miss Murray, he said, eyeing her. Good to know you've better dress sense out to the factory than in it, Maeve eyed Andy. Wish I could say the same for you, Mr Strawbridge. The bar lady swiped at the counter in front of Maeve with a cloth. What are you having? Three vodkas with a dash of orange, please, Teresa. Maeve watched the vodka drain from the bottle as Andy continued to eye her. She liked him looking at her, but she hated that he was so obvious. A blind man on a galloping horse, let alone a function room full of nosy factory folk, would realise he was latching over her. Vodka and orange, eh? Andy said. I would have thought you were more of a cocktails woman. A mojito, maybe. Maeve had no clue what a, a mojito was, but she wasn't going to admit that. Thanks a million, Teresa, Maeve said, pushing the drinks together and lifting them. Trust me on the mojitos, Maeve, Andy said. You're definitely a mojito woman. Andy, she answered. I'd trust you as far as I could throw you. She basked in his laugh as she walked off. But when she put the glasses down in front of Caroline and Aoife, they slid their drinks towards them without saying, Och, thanks, dotes. What was going on there? Caroline asked, running a finger through the condensation on her glass. Just Andy being a dick. Caroline took a careful sip of her drink. You mind yourself around him, Maeve. He's too fly for the likes of us. Ah, fuck Andy, Maeve said, raising her glass. Here's the free drinks. Aoife gripped her glass hard, then raised it. Let's not fuck Andy. Caroline laughed and clashed her glass off Aoife's. I'll drink to that, she said. Slauncher. The prods began to loosen up as the drink flowed, so Caroline went over to some of the machinists she knew for a chat. 
Maeve staggered over and plopped down beside Fidelma. Fidelma, what's the crack? Not a while lot, Fidelma said. Do you think Billy's loosened up with a drink? Aye, he was in wild bad humour about drinking here. Fidelma took a drink of her pint. Remember your man, Cedric Moore, the milkman that got the works up by the border? What may have remembered was how their milk deliveries were disrupted, while undertakers picked Cedric's flesh off the hedges and sifted through the broken bottles they'd shoveled off the road for shards of bone. You Dior, wasn't he? Aye. Thirty-two years old, Mabel Moore's youngest, and Billy Stone's uncle. Fidelma glanced over at Marilyn, then back to Maeve. Marilyn Spears married into them. Of course, she lost her own father in an ambush way back before our time. He was our UC. Fuck. Maeve had never really connected the blurry faces she'd seen on the news over the years with the names of the Protestants she now worked with. So they're touchy sometimes, them ones, Fidelma said, frowning. Of course, the twelfth coming up doesn't help. About half an hour later, Andy stood up, held a glass in the air and wrapped a spoon on it. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. You've exhausted our celebratory fund, Andy said, saluting the room with his glass. A few people, prods mostly, raised their glasses in response. Maeve watched Andy stroll out of the door. She felt like running after him and hijacking him forcing him to drive her over the border to some seaside town where she'd demand a cocktail and a bag of bacon fries. Mabel Moore drained the last of her pint, then hunted for her handbag. A notion took Maeve. The sort of notion that only entered her head after drinking more than her fair share of free vodka. She staggered over to Marilyn's table. You away on, Mabel? Hey, I'm away on to my bed. Well, sure, it was crack while it lasted. Hmm. Hmm, Mabel grunted, standing up. Maeve caught the whiff of old Lady Pish. As Mabel howled towards the door, Marilyn gestured at the empty chair. Will you not sit down? There was something rattish about Marilyn's smile. But Maeve remembered Dale Carnegie's advice that winning friends begins with friendliness, so she sat down heavily. The seat was oddly warm. Maeve was thankful that Mabel's Proddy buttocks were warmer than her cold hagars. So you've had an all right night? Maeve asked. Well, free booze tastes better than cheap booze, Marilyn said. And every penny counts with the wages some of us is on. Maeve shifted as Marilyn wobbled her head at her. Billy picked up his pint and looked sideways at Marilyn. I'm clearing the fuck out of here as soon as I fire this down me. Marilyn got to her feet. I'll put that song in that jukebox for you. Maeve was left alone at the table with Billy. Sure, Kelly's isn't so bad, is it now, Billy? Maeve said. Some of your side even pay to drink in here the odd time. Billy gazed at Maeve with interest now. She noticed how blue his eyes were. Nice enough place, he said amiably, looking around. Then he locked eyes with her again. No real cover in here, though, is there? Maeve knew exactly what Billy meant. A gunman would only have to open the door to have a 180-degree angle on the room. It was real good of you to invite the likes of me in here, he said reflectively. Learned a lot, so I did. Maeve suddenly felt sick. She stood up and clutched her hand to the back of her skirt. It was wet through. Maeve ran into the toilets and slammed into a cubicle. When she pulled off her skirt, her stomach was turning. It stank of pish. Prory pish. She laid the skirt on the water tank of the toilet and bulked. When she was done, she pressed a wad of loo roll into her skirt over and over again to soak the worst up, then sprayed air freshener over it. Maeve slunk back to her table. I have to go, Maeve said quietly to Caroline. What's wrong? Eve asked. A gust of laughter rose up from the prod sitting at Marilyn's table. Mabel's chair was conspicuously empty. 
I just have to go, Maeve said. Caroline and Aoife exchanged looks and picked up their glasses. Then the bass line of Simply the Best thunked from the jukebox. Ah, stay for this song, Maeve, Caroline said, clutching Maeve's arm. Marilyn, Billy and some of the other prods were singing along. The buzz in the bar started to die down as the singing got louder and louder. Billy Stone was walloping the table like it was a drum. When Tina Turner lashed into the chorus about being simply the best, Marilyn and her cronies responded by roaring, Second Battalion of the UFF! I think we need to get out of here, Maeve said. Fast. She staggered into the alleyway. The night air tasted sweeter and colder than anything she'd drunk all night. She gulped it down until she couldn't breathe, then vomited in the gutter. Saturday, 2nd of July, 1994. Mrs O'Neill had invited Maeve and Caroline over to dinner to thank them for having Aoife over for lunch every day. Visiting Aoife's house was an honour not commonly granted. Maeve was obsessed by the house. Each wall in every room was painted a slightly different shade of white. Mrs O'Neill had once shown me of the colour cards, which had included colours like bone white, frost breath and linen dust. Maeve had cracked some joke about cocaine and white that had made Mr O'Neill crease up before he wilted under Mrs O'Neill's gaze. It was the only house in the town that ever featured in magazines. Mrs O'Neill shared her tips on interior design. The storage bench in the kitchen is actually an artisanal pig's trough that we stumbled across during a family ramble. The farmer almost paid us to take it away. It's Irish oak. And that was Aoife's family. They were so fucking rich, so smart and secure, they could dig a pig's trough out of the shit and do it up for a seat and no one would laugh. Maya felt fatter, itchier, poorer and thicker when sitting opposite Mrs O'Neill's ash blonde hair, ice chip eyes, white linen shirts and faded blue jeans. It's not long now until you're off to France, is it Mrs O'Neill? Caroline said. It's sickened me of shite that Caroline was even lovelier than her usual lovely self in the O'Neill's lovely house. No, we get the ferry on Wednesday. And are you going for long? Well, this year, what with the exam results, we'll just stay a month. So it's just Aoife here, all on her own? Maeve asked. James has promised to drive home every weekend to keep an eye on the place. Maeve had to admire the way Mrs O'Neill didn't need to don a balaclava and brandish a sawn-off shotgun in order to issue a warning. Don't you have any holiday plans of your own, Maeve? Maeve shrugged, like holidays were a bag of shite she had zero interest in. The whole factory shuts down for the twelfth week. Caroline's heading to Donegal with her lot, so I have the flat to myself. Imagine the view you'll get of the parades, Caroline joked. Almost as good as the view of the bonfire from here, Maeve said. That monstrosity, Mrs O'Neill said, in a tone that made me feel she was a monstrosity for talking about the huge bonfire the prods built on the riverbank opposite the O'Neill's house every July. Maeve was trying to make a slither of homemade apple pie last her as long as it was lasting the O'Neill's, which she was managing by drinking a whole lot more than them. This young lady here, John said, pointing a fork in Aoife's direction, wanted to be a nun for a while. No, no way, Caroline laughed. It was only for a year or so, Aoife said with great dignity. Caroline, let me guess, John smiled. You wanted to be a... She had a notion of being a shepherdess for a while, Maeve tattled. <laughs> a shepherdess? <laughs> Caroline, Mrs O'Neill laughed. Caroline fired a dirty look at Maeve. I've applied for politics in McGee. I'm counting on converting to the teaching after graduation. You'll make a great teacher, John said decisively before turning to Maeve. And so, what did you want to be? The O'Neill's eyed Maeve as if she was a monkey in a lab who'd been given a brush and paints. 
Would the subject eat the paints or create a work of art? Well, Eurifa was there the day I decided to become a journalist. Really? Mrs. O'Neill said, holding her napkin. Yep. My 13th birthday. Was that the day Linus McMurphy found the booby trap bomb? John asked. Maeve nodded and eased into the tale of what happened when Linus McMurphy found a bomb up the Killeen Road, a couple of miles outside town, and carried it the two miles home, before defusing it with his bare hands on the green. Maureen McKay hauled him off by the lug, then got a few of the local hard men over to check out the situation. After some discussion, they agreed to inform the police. One minute Maeve was sitting in the kitchen, eating cake, the next she was being evacuated out of the back door. Maeve's mum and dad joined the crowd at the security cordon, about 250 yards back from the bomb. There was a festive atmosphere, for with the bomb scattered in bits on the green, there was no danger of an explosion. But then the bomb squad arrived. It's all right, Maeve had said Deepa, it's going to be fine. Then the controlled explosion detonated and blew in most of the windows in the estate. There wasn't a scratch on Aoife when Maeve's mam handed her over to Mrs O'Neill an hour later, but she was still trembling. That evening, after Maeve's da had taped plastic to their front windows and her mam had shaken the glass from their bedsheets, they watched the news. A reporter described how cowardly IRA bombers had planted a viable device in a crowded residential area. But Linus McMurphy found it up the Colleen Road, Maeve exclaimed. It was never planted anywhere near the town. Is there any word from the council on how long it'll be before we get our Wendy's back in? Her mum asked. Maeve thought of the remains of her birthday cake, lying in the bin, riddled with glass shards, and she realised that she wanted to broadcast the truth instead of parroting the government's agenda. Of course, she'd frame things a bit differently for the interview panel over in London and for the O'Neills. After witnessing that incident, I decided to become a journalist so I can share the hurt behind the headlines with readers and viewers across Britain and Ireland. Journalism's not an easy job, Maeve, John said, but I'd say you're well able for it. But it isn't just tough, Mrs O'Neill said. It's dangerous. I'd be terrified to think of Aoife investigating people like Michael Stone. Mrs O'Neill had pinpointed what Maeve had been trying to hide from everyone, including herself. Journalism put the shits up her. Well, I wouldn't mind working on a fancy magazine instead of crime investigations, Maeve said, but it's not easy to break into them. Not for the first time, Maeve felt Mrs O'Neill's eye slide over her synthetic fibres and serving wench cleavage. Mrs O'Neill gave her the impression that nobody was going to pay me of good money to write about drinking cocktails. They'd have her dig in the dirt in paramilitary drinking dens. Sure you can write on the side, John said, until you're established. Make a name for yourself before you end up saddled with a husband and kids. Maeve nodded and smiled at the stain she'd made on the tablecloth. They talked the talk, the O'Neills did. All jobs and marriage and babies. Her mom never shouted on like that. She had a suspicion her mom's highest hope was that Maeve would live long enough to graduate. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Factory Girls by Michelle Gallen, Episode 6 Maeve is trying not to get distracted by small-minded men in her small-minded town. She tries to focus on her exam results and the prospect of a journalism course in London, which is easier said than done. Monday, 11th of July, 1994 Scott Fitzpatrick and Maeve were sitting at opposite ends of the old, scrubbed soft kitchen table in the O'Neill's house. James was stirring a pot while Aoife was staring out of the window at the proddy kids swarming around the bonfire across the river. Maeve had got her first taste of Scott down the town the day before. She'd bumped into James and his friend while shopping with her mam. 
After they'd walked off, her mum had said, God, oh, if Vaughan was an ice cream, he'd lick himself. So, Maeve, Scott said, where is it you've applied for again? Scott was studying medicine in Oxford and had told Maeve that he'd an ambition to practice as a gynaecologist. But she knew by the cut of him that no matter how much he'd learned about textbook pussies, he wasn't qualified to handle one in the wild. UCL. Fantastic place, UCL, Scott said. You do well to get in there. I hope you've a fallback position. Goldsmiths, Maeve said, shutting him the fuck up. James brought a big pot over to the table and began serving spaghetti. It slithered onto Maeve's plate, slick with olive oil. Then he ladled a rich, red, meaty sauce on top. As soon as James lifted his fork, Maeve tore into the food. She finished first, of course, then pushed her empty plate away. James, that was unbelievable, she said, doing this kissy fingers thing she had seen on The Godfather. Absolutely amazing. Scott was mopping up sauce with a piece of bread. You'll make some woman a fine wife. Nobody laughed. But Maeve suspected Scott didn't care. He was just a sneery cunt, like the scummy lawyer and pretty woman. After dinner, they went out into the balcony to watch the bonfire burn over the river, while the giant, lumbering heartbeat of a lamb drum pulsed under a scrape of flutes. The next morning, the scorched grass around the smouldering bonfire was lumpy with unconscious loyalists. The bucks and bowler hats had already started up at the flutes and drums again. Maeve began drinking early that morning. It was in the air. The lamb bags pounding. The breeze thick with the stench of the bonfire. She was drunk by lunchtime, but she kept going. They all did, drinking quietly and steadily. Hours, perhaps days later, Maeve was trying to open a bottle of Smyrnaf she'd nicked from the pantry. It slipped and smashed on the floor. Suddenly, she was back in their kitchen at home, in a smog of burnt fish fingers, with Deidre screaming in her face over a bottle of smashed ketchup. Maeve had started to clear the table while Deidre dropped on her knees before the broken bottle. The next minute, their mam hissed, Oh, holy fuck! Deidre was staring at a neat red line across her left wrist. Maeve could still see the colour. It was the red of fairy tales, of Snow White's lips, of poisonous berries, of ruby slippers, of still beating hearts steaming in the winter air. Stupid, selfish wee bitch! Their mama said, pulling Deidre to her feet. Deidre's eyes were glittering, not with tears or anger, but with relief. What now? Their dad asked. She's cut. She'll need stitches. Maeve watched a nurse stitch Deidre. Because of the nature of Deidre's injury, a doctor was summoned to speak with them before discharge. Their mom caught a grip of Deidre's good wrist. You try that again, she hissed. I'll fucking kill you myself. Are you okay, Maeve? Maeve blinked. James was standing in front of her. Broke broke the bottle. It's okay. I'll clean it up. I'm so, so sorry. Broke the bottle. She knelt down to pick up the shards of glass. Tears splattered into the puddle of vodka. You need to lie down, James said putting his arm around her waist. He led her up the stairs to bed. She was sure he only kissed her to stop her from saying sorry, sorry, over and over again. She'd never tell him she only kissed him back to see something other than pity on his face. The next morning, she woke in her clothes, her head pounding. James lay on his stomach beside her, sound asleep. She allowed herself to stay for a few moments, observing the skimmed milk shade of his eyelids. She climbed out of bed and gathered up her things. She had a bad feeling she wasn't done being sorry. Monday, 18th of July, 1994. As they crossed the road over to the factory, Paddy Quinn and Baldy McGee were standing in the drizzle at the door, smoking. Then a big truck with an Antrim number plate pulled up at the gates and blasted its horn. What's in the truck? Caroline asked Paddy. It's the McAllister's material. He said, at least they've delivered that much on their promise. What are you saying? 
Maeve asked. Paddy gleeked round before answering. McAllister's would be a fairly Protestant setup, he said. There's no wild reason for them to be loyal to the likes of this place. Mixed, you mean? That. Paddy nodded. And then there's our management. We're an unusual setup. He raised both eyebrows. Maeve nodded back, though she hadn't a clue what he was driving at. She heard the big double doors at the back of the factory creak open. Baldy waved the truck up tight to the entrance. Billy Stone and Paddy Quinn began to unload the bolts of fabric. How much is that now, Mary? Fidelma Hegarty asked, eyeing the amount of fabric. Looks like only a fortnight's worth of work. Mary rubbed her forehead with the heel of her hand. Enough to keep you busy. Billy heaved a roll of fabric onto the cutting table. Well, I suppose I'd better crack on, Fidelma said, scissoring her clippers in the air. Billy slipped on his chainmail glove and switched the cutting blade on. Maeve watched him shear the blade through the fabric until the green light on her iron clicked on. Then she sent a puff of steam into the air, pulled a shirt to her board and got back to work. Andy arrived in the door at 8.15. He dashed up the stairs and stood on the mezzanine, stroking his tie in a way that made Maeve picture him admiring his own dick. Maeve got back to her shirt. Now that her muscles had warmed up, it felt like she'd never been off, but the atmosphere had changed. A good bit of the tension that had ratcheted up before the 12th had evaporated. Most of the prods had the look of a bled goose, like the marching and drumming had helped them work something out of their system. That afternoon, the first of the new shirts reached Maeve. She enjoyed pressing the good thick fabric. She was surprised when the home bell went. The working day had gone in faster than a week off. The next afternoon, Andy stopped at Maeve's pressing station and watched her work for several minutes. Ms. Murray! What? she said, without taking her eyes off her shirt. Call up to my office later, he said, then strode off. Maeve's nerves weren't good after that. She didn't want to head to Andy's office, for she was nowhere near finishing his stupid book, having got wound up reading chapter 12. If you're wrong, admit it. But after the last tea break, she climbed the stairs and put her head around his door. Yes, certainly, he was saying down the phone. I'll check that too. He beckoned her in with a wave of his hand. Yes, yes. Look, I have someone with me in the office here, so I can't go into that right now. Maeve looked at the litter of Invest NI grant forms covering his desk. Right, I'll let you know. Bye. Andy dropped the handset, back down in the cradle with a clatter, then smoothed his tie. Ms. Murray. Mr. Strawbridge. Andy tipped back in his chair and looked at Maeve. I'm curious about just exactly what your potential is. You know, Miss Murray, I have a suspicion you're not all that different to me. Andy considered Maeve in the same way her mam eyed up the special offer joints in the butcher's window. I come from nothing, he said. I've had to claw my way out of the muck. Maeve wanted to know what he thought of as muck. Andy had the sheen of someone who'd had a hot dinner every day. Seems to me, Maeve said, that you've swapped muck for shit. Andy narrowed his eyes and sighed. Northern Ireland's potential might not look magnificent to the casual observer, he said. But with these peace talks, there's a chance of change. Nobody may have knew, believed that the talks about talks would lead anywhere other than more shite talking about shite talking. You're telling me you believe in the peace process? I said I sense there's opportunity over here. I'm working in this underprivileged community, Andy continued, as if Maeve was holding a mic in front of him. To create a model for community integration and prosperity that will shine as an example for other workplaces across Northern Ireland. Good luck with that, Andy, Maeve said. He smirked. Oh, I don't need luck, Ms. Murray. Just a little more time. He got to his feet and walked around to where Maeve was sitting. He pulled her to her feet. 
then brushed her hair from her face and kissed her. Maeve walked down the factory stairs using the same level of attention that she put into pretending she wasn't drunk in front of her mum. Later, after work, Maeve and Aoife were standing at the factory gates waiting for Caroline. I don't get your thing for Andy, Aoife said. It's like you both hate each other, and yet you both want more of each other. Maeve watched Andy's jag roar off up the street. Andy's English, she said. And I've been raised to hate the English. Maeve remembered standing inches away from Andy's chest in his office. I get that bit, Maeve, Aoife said. It's the whole sort of fancying him thing that I don't understand. Andy hadn't tried to fuck Maeve. He'd stepped back from her before saying, I think you've got a lot of potential, Ms. Murray. He told me he thinks I've got potential, Aoife. And maybe that's what I'm horny for. Someone believing in me? Yes, but potential for what? Aoife asked, looking worried. Caroline left the flat to take Nana Jackson to Thursday night bingo, leaving Maeve alone with how to win friends and influence people. She'd just started chapter 18, What Everybody Wants, when the doorbell rang. Fidelma was standing on the street, a blue bag hanging heavy in her hand. Fidelma settled herself into Maeve's armchair. Then she dipped into her bag and brought out two tins of cider. Fidelma's tin hissed with satisfaction as she pulled the ring. Not long now to your results. Monday two weeks. So it's England you're heading to? Assuming you get the results? Aye, London. Och, London? No, I've not been. I only was over myself for the interviews. Be some change for ye, London? It will I. Would you head over to England yourself if you had the chance? Or the States, maybe? Hmm, the States is awful far. Uh, not mad about England. But it's an easier lap. When were you in England? I was over in Liverpool a while back. Och, were ye? How'd you find it? Och, grand. Good enough crack once, eh? Got the abortion over with. Maeve took a gulp of cider. She'd never heard anyone other than a priest say the word outside religion class. And priests never simply said the word. They hissed or thundered it. Och, uh, right, Maeve said. Was that a Hanlon? Well, figuring out how to get over the water and paying for the whole shebang was a Hanlon. But do you know something? For all that old shite that the Holy Joes talk about regret, that was grand afterwards. Fidelma stared at her tin for a few moments. I thought you should know that uh, Andy Strawbridge put up the money for my trip. Maeve swallowed a mouthful of cider, felt it sizzling in her stomach. Did he? Fuck knows it probably wasn't his. But when I uh, tackled him about it, he was quick enough to put the money on the table. Sterling notes too. Fidelma said, nodding approvingly. It's kind of thoughtful, Andy, to give you sterling, Maeve said. Well, you could take it that way. Or you could say to yourself, I probably wasn't the first woman that buck sent over the water for an abortion. Fidelma took a mouthful of cider and swallowed it like she was down in a pill. And I doubt it'll be the last. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Factory Gardens by Michelle Gallen, Episode 7. With both her love life and hopes for peace in Northern Ireland in tatters, Maeve is pulled back to a past trauma. But in the present, some explosive revelations about her summer job are about to come out. On Friday, Caroline went bowling with her new boyfriend, Martin, which would have been no big tickle if Aoife wasn't away to Belfast to see some film James was mad for. 
Maeve was left facing one of the biggest problems she had with living in a small town. She'd run out of people she wanted to talk to. Never mind, fuck. In pure desperation, she walked over the road home and let herself in the door. Hello? Wish to Maeve, will you? The news is coming on. Maeve crept into the living room and sat down beside her dad. That murder attack in Neary will be on, he said to her, patting her knee. Wonder now, will it be as bad as the parish hall murder was? Maeve asked. I heard nobody was dead, her dad said. But they reckoned over 40 injured. A plummy BBC reporter described the murder attack as an emphatic terrorist response to Sinn Féin's rejection of the Downing Street Declaration. Maeve wasn't mad about murder bombs. She preferred ordinary bombs. They usually came with warnings, which didn't always get the timing right or the location dead on, but you get the gist that there was a bomb nearby. That it'd go off sooner or later, giving you time to evacuate or at least draw the curtains to stop the worst of the glass from cutting the lugs off you. Maeve had learned early on to sit still after an explosion. Sometimes the electric would be blown out and they'd sit around the battery radio with candles lit, waiting for the official news reports that supplemented and often contradicted the word they'd got from their neighbours. By the time Maeve was ten, the walls around the RUC barracks at the heart of the town were so well reinforced, bomb blasts deflected outwards annihilating any nearby houses and humans. The Parish Hall murder attack had come as a surprise, not just to the RUC, but also to everyone who'd been involved in the dress rehearsal of the Christmas show. Miss McGee had wanted to raise money for the Rwandans, who, she'd explained, had recently gone buck mad and were killing each other at a fierce rate. Because the primary and secondary schools performed a mini and big version of the Nativity, Miss McGee was allowed to put on a secular show. Every teenage girl in town pleaded with her to do dirty dancing. But Miss McGee, ever the realist, had chosen the Wizard of Oz. Deidre and Maeve had got parts playing munchkins. The dress rehearsal was taking place in the parish hall. Deidre and Maeve had pushed their way in through the big double doors with a crowd of other reins. The hall was warm and bright bosom with excitement. Maeve and Deidre sat in the plastic chairs lining the walls and watched Miss McGee put Dorothy, Scarecrow, Tin Man and Lion through key moves from their role while in costume. When Miss McGee was satisfied that her stars were safely double stitched into their costumes, she clapped her hands together above her left ear to get a bit of quiet, then directed everyone into place. The curtain rose to reveal Roshi McGrath's Dorothy chatting to a toy dog in a basket, while Linus McMurphy crouched under the stage, yipping and barking in response. Auntie M said to find a place where there isn't any trouble. Where do you think I should look, Toto? Roisin listened with her head cocked, while from under the stage Linus McMurphy barked something that, if you were feeling cynical, might have translated as, Try my hairy hole! Roisin looked out into the hall, letting her eyes drift over their heads and began to sing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. She had a voice back then. Roisin did. And she was gorgeous. Fifteen years old, getting ready to sit her GCSEs at the singing and the dancing, even when she wasn't cast in local productions. She was a total dose. Roisin was good enough to pin everyone in the hall in the moment with her voice, the longing in it. Which was when the first mortar had hit the parish hall. Maeve learned later that the IRA had fired three mortars. The second one had bounced off the bark walls and exploded in the bookies next door. The third one had sailed over the walls and landed inside, but failed to explode. The news reports had said the children were lucky. For despite being packed together in the parish hall, they'd received only minor injuries. Before that evening, Maeve had thought lucky was finding 50 pence in a coat your mum had bought from the St Vincent de Paul shop. She didn't feel lucky when she felt the slap of the explosion, the air sucked from the hall, and then blown back in around them, glass 
shredding first the curtains, then their clothes, and finally their skin. When the lights went out, someone started at the squealing. Then others joined in, like they'd rehearsed it. The street lamps were blown out. Moonlight shone through the shattered windows, spotlighting the glass glinting underfoot, on clothes and hair. Maeve stood up, glass crunched under her shoes. Her legs trembled as though they weren't sure of the weight of her. She put her fingers on her face. It felt slick with makeup. Everything and nothing hurt. Deidre? Maeve's voice didn't carry over the screams, the squeals and the shouts. The fire station siren wailed and shop alarms throbbed in the background. Deidre! Maeve could hear herself whining. She searched for Deidre in a chorus line of faces, shining with makeup, blood and tears, and eventually found her cowering against the wall, her eyes wide open. Maeve stumbled over and sat beside her. They held hands as Frankie McCammy carried Roisin McGrath off the stage. Grown-ups with torches arrived and led them into the chapel, where Maeve observed the wounded being triaged like she was watching a Christmas special of Casualty, until her mam rushed in, without her coat. Their mam had scanned the chapel, then locked her gaze on them and came at them like a guided missile. You's all right? Maeve had nodded, but Deidre kept doing her staring thing. Their mam had pulled them to their feet and shooed them towards the door. Nurse McKenna shouted over to say if she'd wait five minutes, she'd check them over. Maeve's mam shook her head, saying, They're grand. Not a bother on them. And they were grand too. Once they were sitting on top of blankets on the sofa, drinking Ovaltine and watching Miss Marple. Maeve was called up to the bath first. The smell of Daryl scalded her nose as she entered the bathroom. She stood on top of an old newspaper which cut the glass fragments that fell as her mam pulled her costume from her back. Maeve eased herself into the hot water. This is going to sting. She scooped water up with the jug and poured it over Maeve's back. The disinfectant sang in her sliced skin. Her mam showered the glass from her hair. She told Maeve to keep still while she drained the bath. After she was rinsed and dried, her mam handed her pyjamas, warm from her radiator. Oddly, Deidre, who'd been right beside Maeve when the mortar bomb hit, didn't have a scratch on her. The next day, they heard that Roshi McGrath had been kept in hospital overnight. Though she'd only suffered what the media dismissed as cosmetic injuries. She was filmed on her hospital bed, describing how she'd been singing when the mortar hit. That new segment was Roisin's 15 minutes of fame. For you knew, looking at her face, that her life would never be the same. Monday, 1st of August, 1994. Caroline was going for a drive up to the TV mast outside Straban. Martin's such a dote. He's taken me up to Leg Fordrum this evening to watch the sunset. Maeve had waved them off, pure annoyed at being left to make her own tea. In the end, she decided to head over home to see if she could scrounge some fish fingers. She ducked into the shop and picked up Mr Kipling's French fancies so she wouldn't arrive with her two arms of one length. Then she let herself in the door. Lo, come on in, Maeve. Sarah's here. Maeve's heart sank. Sarah McCanny, the owl scrounge would have already hoovered up the last of the fish fingers. And, right enough, when Maeve put her head around the door, there Sarah was, lying up on the sofa, eating a fish finger. The telly was off, because Sarah was of that generation that couldn't manage to chat shite and watch shite at the same time. Maeve nodded at Sarah as she edged her way to the kitchen, clutching her bag. Are you putting the tail on there, Maeve? Might have a wee cup. Sure, you might as well put a pot on and bring cups for everyone. Your father's over at Toots Place. Maeve fired the French fancies onto the worktop, 
She slung the kettle under the tap, all the time seething at the roundy belly on Sarah. She hadn't made her own tea since the autumn of 1982, when her only son Dermot was arrested at Manchester Polytechnic and was given three concurrent life sentences for running a bomb factory. Since then, Sarah had saved every penny she had for her seasonal coach and ferry trips to an English jail. Maeve knew feeding Sarah her tea every day was her community's way of supporting the family during this miscarriage of justice. But it didn't take the edge off her hunger. Sarah beamed at Maeve when she left the pot in front of the fire to brew. Aren't ye a great help to your mammy, even though you've left home? Maeve braced herself for an interrogation as intense as anything the Brits had put Sarah's son through over in London. So, not long to know the results, eh? Sarah said. Maeve shook her head. So, heading over the water, are ye? I hope to head to London to do journalism, Maeve said. Sarah squashed her chin into her neck, creating a stack of skin that rippled disapproval from her forehead all the way down to her vest top. Journalism, is it? No easy job for a woman. And only a skate away from Towton. Ach, it's probably London I'll work in after I graduate. Wouldn't want to risk working over here, Maeve said. Well, now, you'd need to mind yourself over and beyond and all. Think on my Dermot. Think on the years he's been rotten in an English jail. Maeve did sometimes picture Dermot, rotting like a spud in a dark cupboard. A cautionary tale of a tag with notions who flew too close to the imperial sun. She got to her feet and went out to get the French fancies. Sure you can't beat the wee French fancy, Sarah said when she came back in. Maeve smiled at the fish finger crumbs, trembling in Sarah's whiskers, wishing she was the one up the top of Leg Fordrum getting the whole road offer underneath the TV mast. Monday, 8th of August, 1994. Aoife dropped into the flat with her serious head on. Anyone want a sneaky wee vodka? Caroline looked at Maeve as if she'd suggested they home pierce their genitalia. Aoife nodded. Just the one. I'll do you a Coke, Caroline. Maeve brought in a bottle of Tesco Value Vodka, some glasses and two litres of real Coke. She handed Caroline and Aoife their drinks. So I reckon I'm at about 200 shirts to the good so far this week. That's an extra fiver. What are you at? I've been looking at the cost of a shirt, Aoife said. What we get against what they cost in the shops. Maeve sighed. Aoife was going to tell them that they were being shafted by Andy. Aye, but sure, Andy has to pay for the cost of running the factory. Electricity and that. Transport and all? Aoife tossed her notebook on the table. Yep, I dug into all that. And when Daddy got back from France, he looked up the grant Andy got from Invest NI. It's public domain. Maeve nodded like she knew what public domain was. So then Daddy and I did a rough calculation of stuff like tax and pensions and things like that. Aoife pushed her notepad across the table. Maeve scanned the figures. So he's screwing us? Aoife nodded. Daddy said McAllister's might be colluding with Andy. Andy's not running a shirt factory, Maeve said. It's a fleecing parlour. Aye, Caroline said, and we're the sheep. I need a drink. Maeve passed her the vodka, then got up and went to the window. She stared down at the factory, pure raging. She wasn't raging at Andy for ripping them off. She wasn't raging at Aoife for raining their summer. She was raging with herself. She was the one who was supposed to be training for a career in journalism. But it was Aoife who'd uncovered the scam under their noses. Be 
BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Factory Girls by Michelle Gallen. Episode 8. With funny business going on at the factory, and not just Andy's treatment of women, Maeve decides to get some practice at investigative journalism. But in the meantime, there's a small matter of her exam results. It was nearly home time when Maeve knocked on Andy's door. She'd taken all day to work up the nerve to confront him. Well, this is an unexpected pleasure, Ms. Mary. Despite herself, Maeve felt a surge through her body. What can I do for you? Before she could speak, the phone rang. Andy frowned. Answer that. Maeve picked up the receiver. Andy Strawbridge's office? Mary's voice rasped back at Maeve. Ms. Marie, can you send Mr. Strawbridge down to my office? Tell him there are some insurance gentlemen here to see him. Mary says there are some insurance gentlemen who want to see you. Fuck, Andy said, throwing down his pen. Stay here. Maeve had never been alone in Andy's office. She sat down in his chair, enjoying the feel of the warm leather under her arse. She looked at the paperwork on his desk Andy was filling in an application for the final 10% payment of a grant. Maeve sucked in her breath. £21,000. Money like that would buy four council houses in her estate. She picked up a sheet of paper printed with a list of names. Her own name jumped out at her, alongside a row of numbers. As Maeve scanned the figures, she realised it was an accurate record of what she'd been paid each week in the factory. But then she noticed how long the list ran on. Hugo Arkinson, Mary Bradley, Brenda Coyle, Francis Duffy, Miriam Frost, Cecil Jones. Half of these names were fake. Maeve realised that she'd got proof that Andy was defrauding the government. And that put the shits up her. If she was a character in a Nancy Drew novel, she'd steal the payroll printout and walk out of the factory door with Aoife. They'd take the printout in Aoife's notebook to a big newspaper who'd piss their pants to break the exclusive story. Maeve would be rocket-launched into the world of investigative journalism while Aoife's fledgling legal career could be gold-stamped by Andy's criminal conviction. But the only reporter Maeve knew was Paddy Slavin in the Town Times. And his expertise lay in identifying who was who in the vintage First Holy Communion pictures which left her with the only other law and forces she could think of. The IRA. She tried to imagine what Bernadette Devlin would do. What Fidel Mahegarty would do. Then she folded out the printout and shoved it down her knickers. It's not like Kieran Friel's name was listed in the yellow pages under Community Justice. Maeve just knew that his bell was the one she needed to ring. One of his sons opened the door. I need to speak to your da. Maeve could imagine the sort of people this lad had seen asking to speak with his da. He's in the living room. Kieran Freel sat in the armchair nearest the fireplace. A car engine revved on the tally. Kieran looked up at Maeve, expressionless. I need to speak to you. Kieran turned down the TV volume. Take a seat. Maeve found herself perching like a young priest on the edge of the sofa. You're Sean Murray's daughter. Aye, Maeve. And you're working in that factory over the road? Maeve nodded. I was very sorry to hear about your sister a while back. Thanks. They sat in respectful silence for a few moments. I heard you might do well in your A-levels. Well, fingers crossed. So where will you head? Maeve knew that Kieran Freel knew where she'd applied to. University College, London. Over to London, eh? Well, us Irish have a long tradition of that now. Sending our brightest and best over the water. May have tried to look mournful. So what is it you wanted to speak to me about? May have took a deep breath. The factory? His eyes were suddenly on her. What of it? We reckon... Andy Strawbridge is lying in his own pockets. Who's we? There was gunmetal in his gaze. 
Me and a couple of the other girls working there. And tell me now, how did you cutties come to that conclusion? Me have swallowed hard. Well, there's big invest NI money flowing into that place and other than his fancy car, we can't see where the money's going for it's not in our pockets. So we took a look at what we're being paid for our shirt pieces, what our wages are, the rent. His costs don't tally with his grants. And then I found this. Maeve unfolded the payroll printout. Did you take his insurance money into consideration? Kieran asked, gesturing for the paper. Is insurance so wild dear? Maeve asked, passing the payroll over. Well, Kieran said, scanning the paper. The factory, being where it is, there are high premiums to pay, locally, like, to make sure nobody would break in and rob those machines or rack the place. Kieran looked up at Maeve. You wouldn't want for him to forget his dues to both sides of the local community. And for that factory to be put at risk and all these hard-won jobs lost. The penny dropped. Andy was paying protection money. And because of the way the town was divided, he was paying it to both sides. Maeve realised Kieran was waiting for her to show that she'd understood. Nah, she said. He should be paying his dues. Some streak of madness made Maeve think that perhaps Kieran Freel hadn't got the full picture. But another problem with Andy Strawbridge is that he has no respect for women. Kieran took a deep, slow breath. I've found myself, he said. That respect has to be earned the hard way. His insult sizzled in the air between them for a few seconds. Then may have felt her fly trap open again. Andy Strawbridge gropes his female employees in the factory floor, she said. He assaults girls in his office. I'm wondering if all this protection money stretches as far as protecting us. Kieran Freel's face and ears turned red. May have wondered where else the blood was pumping. And who's going to back up your story, sweetheart? Kieran asked, crumpling the payroll in one hand. What evidence do you have to bring against this businessman who has brought employment and funds into our economically disadvantaged area? He chucked the payroll into the fire. Maeve stood up and walked to the door. Where do you think you're headed, wee girl? I haven't finished with you. Maeve turned round. I say you're not finished with me, all right. You and your kind. You have us where you want us. You have done for years. But I'm finished with you and this shitty wee town. You're welcome to it. I hope you friggin' well die for it. May have slammed the door behind her, wondering whether she'd make it to London with both her kneecaps intact. Monday, 15th of August, 1994. Results day. Maeve and Caroline were walking through the school gates when Aoife's mother swerved out past them in her blue 2 CV, like she was a getaway driver. Suppose she's picked up Aoife's results, Caroline said. Hmm, suppose, Maeve said. She pushed through the front doors of the school. The Virgin Mary was still peering in, wonder at her feet, as if she'd only just noticed that someone had gloss-painted them peach. Fatty Dolan flicked through to M, selected an envelope, then held it out to Maeve. I'll see you at the lockers, Maeve said to Caroline. A few moments later, Caroline sat down beside her. Ready? Caroline shook her head. Me neither. On the count of three? Caroline nodded. Okay. One... Two, three. Maeve ripped open her own envelope, then stared at her results in disbelief. Jesus, Mary and Joseph, Caroline said. I got all B's. She squealed and beat her feet off the ground. How'd you get on? Maeve passed her slip over to Caroline. Three A's, she squealed. Holy mother of God, Maeve. Maeve hadn't just done it. She had overdone it. Three fucking A's. She stood up and roared. Yes! Maeve gave her da the envelope, then started to shred her split ends. She pulled out her results slip and scrutinised it at arm's length. That's my cutty, 
Mae's ma'am eyed him. Did she do well? She did, he said, patting Maeve. Three A's, he said, pronouncing the letter to rhyme with ba. Three A's, her ma'am said the English way. And how'd that Aoife O'Neill do? She asked. I haven't seen her yet. Then Maeve's ma'am took a step forward and clutched Maeve. Three A's. Well done. And how'd that Caroline doll do? Three B's. Well, her mum said, the Jacksons aren't as slow as they walk easy. Good curry, her dad said, beaming. And you probably did as well as that Aoife O'Neill, eh? Aye. But I have to get back over to the factory. I'll walk you over the length, Maeve's dad said. And I might take a wee dander on down the town afterwards. A wee dander into the school bar, more like. Maeve's ma'am huffed. Well, if I can't lift a glass on a day like this, I don't know when I'll next be able to, he said in high good humour. Eva didn't come in to work. Maeve imagined she was off gallivanting with her parents. When the tea bell rang, Maeve fell into the queue behind Fidelma Hegarty. Results day, eh? Maeve nodded. Did you get what you needed to get out of this place? I did, Maeve said. Fidelma hit her a slap on the back. Great job. And when are you leaving? Mid-September. Mid-September, Fidelma said quietly. Not long now. After work, Maeve dialed Leafa's number in the telephone box up the road and hung up after three rings. Then she pushed her back against the door, ignoring Dervla Daly, who was waiting to use the phone. Maeve? Hey, Aoife. Didn't see you at the factory today. Are you all right? Maeve mouthed, fuck off, at Dervla as she waited for Aoife to answer. I'm okay. Aoife was clearly not okay. Dervla Daly started tapping on the window, pure racking Maeve's head. I got two A's and a B. Och, Aoife, she didn't reply. Och, Aoife, I'm so sorry. Does that mean Cambridge is out? Oxford too. Och, but she will get to Trinity with two A's and a B. Dervla Daly battered the telephone box behind Maeve. Maeve opened the telephone box and roared, Will you fuck off? Almost missing Aoife's quiet reply. But I didn't want to go to Dublin. Och, Aoife. But sure you can move to London after you finish up in Trinity. I suppose. Dervla stuck her middle finger up at Maeve. She mouthed, dead meat, back at her. Maeve wished she knew what she could say to Aoife. Do you want me to come over? The line crackled. Okay, but just for a bit. Mummy wants to talk to me. Maeve did the bye, 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 bye thing. Then she hawked in her throat, spat in the earpiece and placed the phone back in the cradle. She opened the telephone box and aimed a kick at Dervla, who skittered out of reach, laughing. Maeve, Mrs O'Neill said, smiling a smile that didn't reach her eyes. Aoife's just having a shower. Would you like to wait in the kitchen? Maeve followed her through. Didn't Aoife do well? She did. She'll be the first of us to get to Trinity. You must be so proud. Immeasurably. Maeve liked how Mrs O'Neill had the nerve to pretend she wasn't devastated by Aoife's slightly less than perfect grades. Do you want a coffee? Mrs O'Neill said. No, your grand, thanks. Mrs O'Neill nodded slightly. All in black this evening? Are you regressing to your goth phase? No, I suppose black's my favourite colour. Like yourself and the white. Mrs O'Neill looked at Maeve. Black isn't actually a colour, Maeve. Black simply absorbs light. It's the absence of colour. She took a sip of coffee. Some ancient cultures have two words for black. One to describe that luminous, glossy black you see in a piece of polished ebony. So what's the other black? Mrs O'Neill gazed at Maeve. It's the flat, dull black of soot, of outer space. Or depression? Maeve said, suddenly seeing herself as Mrs O'Neill saw her. A black hole at the heart of her family, sucking in all the light and love. 
always needing more. I think Aoife might be out of her shire now, Mrs O'Neill said. I have to go, Maeve said. There's something I forgot to do. She hurried out the back door, leaving Mrs O'Neill sitting like a sphinx at the kitchen table. Maeve rapped on the door of Fidelma's caravan. Uh, brought cider, Maeve said, feeling like a total dick. Um, uh, I'm not disturbing you, am I? Nah, get in. Fidelma said. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Factory Girls by Michelle Gowan. Episode 9. Tensions are rising at the factory, but following their exam results, perhaps the bigger, quieter rift is between Maeve and Aoife. Maeve woke to a dig in the ribs. Maeve! She groaned and curled up into a fetal position. Maeve! Someone shook her by the shoulder, giving her the books. Get up to you fuck, Maeve Murray, or I'll be late. Maeve realised she was lying on Fidelma's sofa. She had no memory of the night before beyond her, and Fidelma playing only a woman's heart and bawling their lamps out. They landed in, reeking of cider and fags, just in time to clock in. Aoife was nowhere to be seen. When the home time bell rang, Maeve collapsed over her ironing board. She'd killed herself all day, but was still drowning in shirts. Mary and Andy were frowning at the folding table beside Sharon Rogers. Fidelma, Caroline, Maeve, Andy said. Over here, please. Fidelma set her jaw and bowled over like she was going to box Andy. Maeve walked over beside Fidelma. Ladies, I'd like you three to stay on and finish up this load of shirts so the McAllister's chap can drive them up the road. Fidelma put one hand on a shirt lying on the table, slowly smoothing it flat. What's it uh, worth to ye, Andy? You'll get paid over time. I want double time. We all do. Fidelma jerked her head in Maeve and Caroline's direction. Just this once, Andy snapped. Andy Fiver, each in her hands as we're going out that door so we can get a feed down the end then. Maeve loved the cheek of Fidelma. There's about two hours work here, Andy said, eyeing Fidelma. You get that done before eight o'clock. You'll get your double time and an Indian. Deal? Deal, Fidelma growled with satisfaction. Maeve and Caroline tore open the Indian takeout and dished it up. Uh, here you've a new fella, Fidelma said to Caroline, who nodded. And is he good to you? Oh, he's lovely. And he's so good to Nana Jackson. Fidelma shot me of an oh God save me now look. And he's a taxi driver. He is, though it's not safe, the taxiing. He'd be better off out of it. Maeve wondered how Martin had the balls to keep at the taxis. Working late, night after night, wondering which call was just another carload of bloodered workmen and which might have been placed by a loyalist paramilitary in possession of a handgun and instructions to kill another tag. Sure, there's plenty of opportunities open to him if he's got a car. I'd have wider horizons myself if I had a car, Fidelma said. Didn't know you'd your driving test, Maeve said. Och, no, no, I don't have a licence or that. But I'd an uncle over the border there. It taught me how to drive. She'd hardly need a licence at all in the free state. It's not like up here with the Brits. I am fuckers, Maeve said, shoveling a mouthful of korma in her. I keep trying to imagine you, living in the thick of them over there in London, Fidelma said, before chomping on a pompadom. Hard to picture. I think I'll manage it. Are you sure now? I mind you the day the on English Peace Choir came to St Jude's. 
Ach, Fidelma, Caroline said. Maeve was only 14. Maeve always felt a bit sick when she thought of that morning assembly. The Middleton Male Peace Choir is touring Northern Ireland, Fanny Dolan had said, singing voluntarily in schools and halls and yet another attempt to promote peace and reconciliation. Something had twanged inside Maeve as a baldy fella told them all to sing along and a bloke on the piano started playing the opening of Imagine. They got as far as hell before Maeve had stood up and stalked out of the assembly hall. They only wanted to sing a few songs, Caroline said, scraping up the last of her tikka masala. They had good intentions. But it's all these good intentions that's killing me, Maeve said. Everyone's always asking us to paint pictures or write poems. Aye, Fidelma said. Nobody's tackling the hard stuff. Like what? Caroline asked. Like taking religion clean out of schools, Maeve said. Leaving it on the altar where it belongs. Aye, said Fidelma again. They should integrate the schools so we get to know each other before we have to work side by side. Definitely, Maeve agreed. You'd be less likely to shoot someone you've been to school with. Huh. Don't know if I'll go that far, Fidelma said darkly. Maeve and Caroline exchanged a quick, did she really say that? Look. They all chewed ferociously on their takeaways for a few moments. Then Maeve swallowed and put her box down. Ugh, listen to us talk shite. It's far easier to up sticks and leave. I'm feared leaving will be the hardest thing any of us ever do, Caroline said. Fuck's sake, Caroline, Maeve said. It's Derry you're going to, not the moon. Maeve didn't want to admit how pleased she was to see Aoife standing at her ironing board first thing Thursday morning. Missed you, she'd said, making Aoife go all pink-cheeked. But as the morning wore on, she realised that something had changed between them. For years she had believed that only if she had something that Aoife craved, like the Nirvana outsesticide bootleg, things would be easier between them. But now she'd earned the results that Aoife needed. The gap between them hadn't narrowed. It had cracked wide open. That gap was the reason Maeve found herself going slow with the shirts, letting Aoife get way ahead of her. The gap was the reason she tried to make herself smaller and quieter, Less pleased with herself, so she wouldn't upset Aoife. She slipped her iron over her shirt collar, wondering if that's what it had been like for Aoife for years. That maybe Aoife had never really enjoyed her house, and clothes and music and books, and soft carpets and parents with Maeve hanging around with her dead sister and shabby shoes and the hungry look in her eyes. Maeve realised Aoife needed friends who were like her. And Trinity College, Dublin would be crawling with folk like Aoife. Maeve's guts sank as she realised it was her who'd ended up being the fish out of water at university, not Aoife. After lunch, Mary emerged from her office and huffed up the stairs to Andy's office. Five minutes later, they both came down the stairs and stood grim-faced at the top of the factory floor. I know you lot have been busting a gut for me these past few weeks, Andy said. He stared over the top of everyone's heads. Mary has learned from the administrator in McAllister's that our cheque won't clear until next week. The floor erupted in fury. Well, Andrew Strawbridge, Marilyn Spears snarled. That's your problem and not ours. Andy folded his arms. I'm here to ask a favour of you. Favours are something you do for your friends, Andy Strawbridge. Fidelma said, you're no friend of anyone in this factory. I was relying on the McAllister's cheque to pay the wages this week, Andy said. We don't rely on McAllister's, Mickey McCanny shouted. We rely on you. The McAllister's cheque will clear next Thursday, Andy said, as though Mickey hadn't spoken a word. On which day I will pay you for two weeks' work. Like, fuck you will. You think we're thick? And how do you think we'll feed our wains this week coming? Look, Andy said, 
It's one week. It's your choice. You can walk now and pick up a single week's pay next week, or you can work now and pick up double next week. You're a real fucker, Andy Strawbridge. Marilyn Spears shouted, stomping up the factory floor. How am I supposed to trust a snake like you? She stopped and glared at the other machinists. I'm walking, she shouted. A few other prods pushed back their chairs and joined her. If enough of you walk, Andy said, I'll walk too. Marilyn Spears had a head of steam worked up so she kept going, but Mabel Moore and Sharon Rogers hesitated at the door. And Billy wasn't in the thick of things for once. He was standing quietly by the cutting machine. I'll shut these factory doors and I won't open them again, Andy said. Think it over, he said before walking up the stairs to his office. Fidelma slammed her foot into the trolley of shirts, sending it flying against the wall. She turned around. Anyone for a smoke? Me, Maeve said. Caroline and Aoife nodded and they all followed Fidelma out the side door. Everything felt unreal to Maeve, the way it had during Deidre's funeral. She felt like she was an actress in a soap opera, waiting for someone else to tell her where to stand, how to look and when to scream. I think we need to quit, Aoife said. He's not going to pay us what we're owed. Not when he's defrauding the place. Fidelma squinted at Aoife with one eye. What are you shitting on about? Me and my daddy had a look into this place. We analysed our pay, the number of shirts we do, the grants he gets. It doesn't add up. So he's screwing us. Fidelma shrugged. Big grants in, skinny wages out. His pockets lined with gold. And not a scrap of evidence to prove a thing. May have thought of the fake payroll burning in Kieran Freel's grate. I don't think it's just Andy who's lying in his pockets, she said quietly. What do you mean? Fidelma snapped. I heard Kieran Freel say that Andy pays his community dues. Protection money, Aoife said. Maeve nodded, wondering how things would have gone if she'd taken a payroll to Aoife. Then shouldn't we explain to Kieran that Andy's not paid us? Fidelma looked at Aoife. I think the wisest thing for all he has to do is to steer clear of Kieran Freel. He probably knew about the McAllister's check before Mary did. Maeve's stomach turned. She didn't feel like admitting what she'd done to anyone, let alone Fidelma. So we should walk, like Aoife is saying, Caroline said. Eason's have no ends, no mortgages, Fidelma said. If I were yous, I'd spend the rest of me summer in front of the telly, or fuck away off to England early. Or we could go to France for a few weeks. Everyone turned and gawped at Aoife. We could stay in our villa, she said. It'd only cost us the price of a ferry and the real tickets. Later that evening, Caroline and Maeve were watching Top of the Pops. Liam Gallagher was droning, live forever, over the heads of some seriously stoky English dolls. So, are we going to get up Monday morning and head into the factory to work for no wages for another week instead of sailing to France tomorrow? Saying it out loud, Maeve realised they were mad to stay in the factory. That they should pack their bags and go someplace hot, foreign and sexy for the first time in their lives. Oh, France is just silliness. Besides, my French is shite, Caroline said. You don't need to speak the lingo. If you'd be dying to do a bit of ooh la la. It's Nana's Jackson's birthday soon. I have never missed her birthday. Ach, Caroline, there's plenty more ahead of her. Go on. I'll go if you go. It'll be an adventure. You two can always go on your own, Caroline said softly. You and Aoife always have fun. Me and Aoife do not always have fun. We have fun. The three of us. Caroline shook her head. Maeve sagged into her chair. So, we'd need to think about giving notice in this place. I'm heading to London the second week of September. When are you starting, McGee? Caroline's face took on an old stubborn cast. 
I'm not going to university. I'm uh, going to stay here. What? But you got three Bs. You could do anything with three Bs. And what I want to do, Caroline said, folding her arms, is stay here. And how are you going to afford the flat? Me and Martin have talked about keeping it on. No France for Maeve. No university for Caroline. Still, there was an upside. That spare room's mine come Christmas. Aye, I'll put a wee stock on it for you, Caroline said. Monday, 22nd of August, 1994. Everyone slunk back to work on Monday. Everyone except for Aoife. Daddy said to steer clear, she said to Maeve. The factory had never felt so grim. That Thursday when the bell rang, Andy cleared his throat before speaking. <clears throat> I was in the bank earlier, ascertaining the status of the McAllister's check. Try again, Andy. This time in English, Marlin said. The McAllister's cheque has cleared. There's money in the bank. A cheer burst out. The loudest and longest Maeve had heard all summer. Mary's in her office, he said, preparing your wage packets ready for you to take home this evening. The bank will be closed, but I've been assured that you may cash them first thing tomorrow. Just before the final bell rang, Mary went to the front door and stood there doling out cheques. Maeve took her cheque without a word, tucked it into her jeans pocket and left the factory. Mabel was leaning beside the gates, puffing on a fag. You are right there, Mabel? Heading down the town for a drink? I am not, Mabel said, shaking her head. We have cashed nothing yet. Them cheques is only but to paper. I'll not rest until I see Queen Elizabeth. God bless her. Resting in my hand. Next morning, Maeve had just sat down with a cup of tea by the living room window when she heard a disturbance on the street below. Marilyn Spears and a few prods were banging on the factory door. A sick feeling rolled up from Maeve's stomach to her throat. What time is it? Caroline asked. Maeve glanced at her watch. Quarter past nine. So the checks have bounced, Caroline said, folding her arms. Maeve sat down heavily in her chair and squeezed her eyes shut. Well, that's not going to help, Caroline said. Get your clothes on so we can go and see what the crack is. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Factory Girls by Michelle Gallen, episode 10. In this final part, things are kicking off at the factory after it has been revealed Andy Strawbridge has been taking his workers for a ride in every sense. But Maeve has bigger fish to fry than getting the wages owed to her. Will she make it out of her wee town to London? Maeve and Caroline crossed the road and joined the edge of the crowd without a notion what they were going to do. Maeve pictured herself with a camera crew, reporting live from the scene, as Marilyn Spears battered at the factory door. Mary pushed the door open. Where's our money? How am I going to feed me wains? I've a mortgage to pay. Where the fuck is he? Mabel Moore shoved her way to the front of the crowd and put herself between Mary and the mob. If you calm yourselves, we might get some answers. Mary pulled her cardigan tight around her daddies. Why didn't you warn us, Mary? Mabel said. I'm well sorry, Mary said. I thought he was playing us fair. Fuck, Mary. Since when have the English ever played us fair? Fidelma said. Maeve picked up the drone of a helicopter coming from the direction of the army base. It was really fucking annoying how quickly the Brits could scramble to this sort of scene. Though it'd take them hours to turn up to an alleyway where a lone Catholic was getting his head kicked in by a crowd of prods. Marilyn Spears barged towards Mary, bristling with fury. Well, I'm going to take a machine for what's owed to me. 
A surge of people carried Maeve towards the door as a helicopter thumped in and hung low over their heads. Then three army jeeps screeched to a halt, the back doors flung open and a dose of Brits trained their guns on the ground. A sullen, explosive silence settled into the yard. <laughs> no surprise who say those fuckers are on, Mickey McCanny grunted. A fleet of armoured police cars pulled up. Two cops climbed out of the first car. The biggest fella walked towards Mary. Having a bit of bother, are ye? There was tracks bounced this morning, Mabel Moore said. Two weeks this factory owes us. The big policeman nodded. And where's the proprietor? Frig knows. I suggest you follow up with the proprietor next week, during normal working hours. Mary glanced at Billy Stone, who frowned at Paddy Quinn. Paddy moved his head so slightly, it could have been a twitch. Right then, let's get this place closed up for now. But nobody moved. This is an industrial matter, best settled by negotiations between your union representative and management. There's no union in this factory. The big policeman tilted his head back to look at Fidelma. No union? Nah, Mabel said. So if they speak for ourselves. Maeve saw a Brit bark something into a walkie-talkie before one of the Land Rovers emptied out. The soldiers took up positions in the car park surrounding them. So, that's the crack, is it? Fidelma said. Maeve moved deeper into the heart of the crowd. Never in her life had she wanted to be so close to a pack of frauds. I'd like to ask you again to leave the premises, the policeman said. Or we may have to consider booking you for trespass. The crowd felt skittish, like sheep shoaling against a wild dog. Right, Fidelma said. Come on, Newtons. We'll tackle Andy another time. Voices spat and crackled on the security force radios as the soldiers watched the crowd retreat outside the gates. Saturday, 27th of August, 1994. There was a bite of autumn about the evening. Maeve had asked Aoife and James to come over for a few drinks. That summer flew by, Aoife said. It did I, Maeve said. When are you leaving? James asked. Maeve shrugged. She hadn't changed her ticket yet. Fidelma had ambushed them with a bag of cider just after Aoife had opened a bottle of wine. Sure, you could head any minute. For there's no factory to go back to, Fidelma said. Who's that? Aoife asked, frowning. Someone was fiddling with the lock on the factory gates. Maeve and Fidelma joined her at the window and watched the intruder open the gate and slip through. Andy Strawbridge, Fidelma said. James jumped up and came to the window as Andy let himself into the factory and closed the door behind him. Fidelma began lacing up her trainers. Where are you going? Maeve asked, rather pointlessly. To do a bit of overtime, Fidelma said, standing up. She dandered out the door. Maeve grabbed her trainers and turned to Aoife and James. We can't let Fidelma head over there alone. James rubbed the back of his neck. She's trespassing, he said. I know it seems like a bit of crack, Eva said, but if I get caught down there and I get a record, I won't be able to practice law. Maeve, James said softly. A criminal prosecution would mess things up for you worse than you can imagine. Maeve emptied her tin of cider down her throat. I could live with a criminal prosecution, she said, but I can't live with letting a friend down. Maeve opened the office door. Do you want a can, Maeve? Andy here says he doesn't drink and drive. Good to know he's got some standards, Maeve said, taking a tin. So where are you parked, Andy? I couldn't see your jag out there, Fidelma asked. I'd like to suggest that you two ladies jog on, Andy said, checking his watch. Are you expecting someone? Maeve asked. Then something clattered in the factory floor below. Andy frowned and stepped quietly onto the mezzanine. 
Keep him occupied, Fadalma said. Maeve crept out behind Andy. On the floor below, figures moved between the tables. Someone switched on a torch and flashed a beam of light over the factory floor. Fuck, Andy said quietly. Not who you were expecting, Maeve asked. Andy turned around, furious. This is not a game. He strode towards her and Maeve retreated. Then the door to his office opened and Fidelma strolled out. Andy turned to the factory floor as Maeve slid towards Fidelma. Maeve tried to forget the look in Andy's eyes when he moved in on her. They were halfway down the stairs when the lights flickered on. Mickey McCanny put his hands in the air looking around for the Brits. Marilyn Spears frowned up at Maeve. Andy gazed at them from over the balcony. Maeve held her breath, waiting for someone to grab an iron bar and charge up the stairs and give Andy the hiding they'd talked about. Then the factory door swung open and Billy Stone and Paddy Quinn walked in. They stopped at the sight of their former colleagues. Uh, Gentlemen, Andy said, should we conclude our business? Billy nodded. Maeve gawped as they walked across the factory floor towards Andy. So that's how equal opportunities works, is it? Fidelma said. Him up there, charming the knickers off Invest I for grants. And the pair of down here, shafting us behind our backs. Paddy Quinn's face was dark with bad temper. You've all got paid for long enough. More money than you would have seen in the dole. No harm. But I'm still short a couple of weeks. Fidelma said. I suggest you took a look around, Billy said. See if there's anything that'd compensate you for your pains. They climbed the stairs and disappeared into the office with Andy. When the door snapped closed, the factory floor erupted into activity. Maeve saw Marlin Spears on her hands and knees, unscrewing her sewing table from the floor. Mickey McCanny was gathering shirts and piling them into a trolley. As she passed the repairs table, Fidelma lifted a pair of scissors and passed another pair to Maeve. Souvenirs, she said, grinning. Then she ducked out of the front door. Maeve followed her out and up the road. Where are you going, Fidelma? I'm after his car, eh? Andy's jag. Then it clicked with Maeve. Fidelma was going to hit Andy where it hurt. I think I know where he might have left it, she said turning down the road towards the garages in their park. And sure enough, Andy's car was pulled neatly into the shadows. Lovely machine, eh? Fidelma said fondly. Won't be so lovely after we're done, Maeve said, raising the scissors above the bonnet. We're not here to wreck the car, Fidelma hissed, grabbing her hand. She reached into her pocket. I've got the keys. Maeve stared as Fidelma climbed inside, then pushed the key in the ignition and lowered the passenger side window. What the fuck are you at, Fidelma Hegarty? You heard Billy yourself. He said to lucky round for something to compensate us for our trouble. Maeve tried to open the passenger door, but it was locked. Maeve, you don't want to be caught in a stolen car. Not when you have a future ahead of you. Fidelma drove off up the border road. The next morning, Fidelma dandered into Maeve's living room. Hiya. And where the fuck have you been? Maeve asked. Ah, took a spin over the border to see family. In Andy's car. Ah, we didn't know what you're talking about, Maeve Murray. Och, Fidelma, what'd you do to it? Fidelma threw a wad of cash on the coffee table. Maeve crammed a fist against her mouth. Oh, fuck! Fuck! You're dead meat, Fidelma! Fuck. There's no law against winning money on a lottery ticket, is there? Maeve burst out laughing. That's only the half of it. I dropped in to Mabel Moore earlier today. Told her to divvy up the other half among her lot. Fidelma picked up the wad of cash and peeled some notes off. Here you go. Your severance package from Strawbridge and Associates Shite Factory. She placed the notes on the table. Maeve picked them up and swiftly counted them. Fidelma, that's a whole lot more than two weeks' pay. 
It's what a union would have negotiated for you if we had been allowed one. Fidelma, how'd you swing all this? My mother's wee brother, over the border there, as a big man at the cars, she said. She peeled a few more notes from the wad of cash. Make sure Caroline gets her share, will you? Maeve nodded as Fidelma took the wad down her top. I have a few more homes to visit. On Tuesday morning, Maeve was lying half asleep in her bed when the doorbell rang. Caroline answered the door. Her stomach flipped when she recognised her mum's voice. She was only a slightly less frightening visitor than Kieran Freel. Her mum sat down on the end of the bed. Kieran Freel called in to see me yesterday. Did he now? Aye. He says he heard you were up to no good in that factory. Maeve opened her eyes wide to say, Who, me? And her mum narrowed her eyes to say, I, you. And he said something about a stolen car. The only thing I stole was a pair of scissors. I'll cut a long story short. He says you're not welcome here. Not now. Not never. You've got 24 hours to get out. After that, there'll be consequences. Something wicked grabbed a hold of Maeve's heart and squeezed. Do you understand what's going on, Maeve Murray? Her mom growled. Maeve nodded. She knew what being run out of town meant. She'd not be allowed home to put flowers on Deidre's grave come Christmas. And do you know how lucky you are to get the chance to walk away? Maeve sighed. Again with the luck. This particularly shitty brand of Six Counties luck. Wednesday, 31st of August, 1994. Maeve stood beside her bags at the bus stop in Oma. Cars were lapping the town, blaring horns, men hanging out of the windows, roaring, for the IRA had announced a ceasefire. The Belfast bus pulled in. Well, I suppose this is you? Suddenly Maeve's mom grabbed her tight. You're not named after your grandmother, you know. Maeve remembered little Granny Marie. A smell of mints. A thin ash stick she kept by her chair for swatting her dogs and grandchildren when they got on her nerves. She was a sour old bitch, her mom said, grimacing. I named you for Queen Maeve. Warrior Queen of Connacht. She gave Ulster hell in her time. Swallows flicked above their heads, days away from migration. Then her mam turned on her heel and walked away. Maeve boarded the bus, stumbled down the aisle and collapsed into an empty seat, her heart breaking. Suddenly the front of the bus dipped to the left with the weight of someone climbing on board. Maeve Murray, where are you? Maeve sat up and put her hand in the air like she was back at school. Fidelma Haggerty nodded at her, thrust her ticket at the bus driver, then shoved her way down the aisle. She dropped a single bag beside Maeve's feet and sat down with a puff. Maeve caught the reek of cider off her breath. I ran in the Marty No Pegs in the clock bar there. Nearly forgot myself. Where are you going? Fidelma eyed Maeve with her Is it pure stupid are ye? face on her. I'm headed to London, just the same as ye. Fed up with this place, so I am. Then she leaned in close to Maeve and whispered, I'm away to join the police. Maeve laughed. Oh, that is fucking deadly, Fidelma. No better woman. Fidelma opened her bag and took out two tins of scrumpy. Maeve's tin hissed in relief when she cracked it open. She held it out towards Fidelma and said, Slauncha. Ach, fuck that old shit, Maeve. It's cheers from here on in. They clashed tins, then guzzled the warm cider as the bus carried the pair of them closer and closer to the grimy pavements of London. You've been listening to Factory Girls by Michelle Gowan. It was abridged by Catherine Williams and read by me, Neve McEnhill. The producer was Kieran Birmingham.
If you enjoyed this, there are lots more abridged audiobooks from Radio 4 on BBC Sounds, including Careering, Daisy Buchanan's frank and funny satire on the world of glossy magazines. Millennial Imogen is very, very tired. After hustling for years as an unpaid intern, barmaid and online sex blogger, she's finally landed her dream job and her first big piece goes viral. Oh my God. Ariana Grande has quote tweeted my threesome piece. Courageous, smart, relatable. Well, maybe I wish it was relatable. Sealed with a wink emoji, of course. And Emily Ratajkowski, this is the writing we need to read post hashtag me too. My heart is pounding. My Twitter profile tells me that I now have 28.9 thousand followers and counting. But as Imogen unwittingly becomes the UK's most audacious young sex writer, even a dream job can turn into a nightmare. Another tweet that has been retweeted into oblivion just reads, slut, 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 whore, salt, slut. Careering by Daisy Buchanan is read by Ellie White and me, Ruth Everett. To listen now, search on BBC Sounds. <laughs>